They were checking in the hotel today. We're going to at, uh, yeah, till Saturday. Yeah, we're going to Epcot. They have like a new after hours thing in Epcot. So we're going to Epcot Thursday night. And then Friday, Dis Disney Springs. But today it's just hanging out at the hotel. I said, good thing because it's yeah, going to be like. That's good. Yeah, my teenagers still like Disney, so I guess that's good. You know? Yeah, yeah. Come on, guys, there's always something, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying not to yawn next to you because I know you're tired. Did you work? No, I don't go back until Friday. Oh, okay. Well, you're good. Okay. Come at it. We not sleep good at all. Maybe two hours. Isn't that terrible? It's rolling around so much. Oh, are you excited about your trip? No, don't get old, girl. Your hips start hurting you and stuff at night with the rain. Yeah. I always make fun of my mother for that, but now I'm just saying, oh, it's going to rain and it's my hip. <laughs> No, I get to go back to work and take all this with me and work and do this and just go. Well, the good news is we're at our halfway point. That's right. <laughs> so it's exciting and nervous. So, yeah. Well, when he get when he go, being over. When he goes to bed, I do I do my work and then I do some of this and then I you know bounce back and forth while he sleeps. That's a good little gig then. Yeah. Um, hey. We can study while he's sleeping. That's good. I'll do this if he calls me. Then I could do that, and I could do this, and kind of, kind of bounce back and forth. It's good. Uh, it's a balancing act. That's right. <laughs> there it goes. My friend says, don't work when you're tired. Well, it started in just a minute. I'm going to give everybody, because the weather's bad, I'm going to give everybody just a few minutes to hear him. So it started in just a minute. I didn't want to put this. What? This? That, page, that next page over. Which one? Can't do that one yet. No, I didn't know it. Where we do the um, what pressure is now? Yeah, I didn't do that. I waited for this class. Yeah, that's what I did too. Next week, let me know what day you want to say that. Yeah, I thought next week we could start yeah, doing that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Let me know. Okay, because I'll say it with you. Okay. Yeah, I figured we could start making plans for that. Especially with doing the uh, the bed changing. Yeah, I thought this is the day. Okay, yeah. Put the one of them down. I figured maybe Wednesday that way because Monday. Perfect. Yeah, Monday you'll be tired. Monday I'll be guitar, so maybe Wednesday. That's fine. Wednesday, Wednesday works for me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. I'm off for the summer because I work for the school, so I'm off. Okay. Yeah. Fernando. Yeah. Which spray set. With the ESC kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah my little son went there for four years. My daughter's there right now. My son graduated two years ago. He did the ROTC program for four years. That's awesome. Before I went certainly straight into service from there. So now he's in Virginia. Oh. He's been in the service since he was 18. That's awesome. He's 27. Very good. Still a little creamy. He's in New Zealand. Wow. 
It's a smart, smart little cookie cake there. I just like to visit it. Oh, at the end of all right maybe they're maybe the rest of them are joining us from youtube world considering the weather is so bad so we'll go ahead and get started set up here Oh, I think it does work. Yay. All right. Oh, that doesn't work. Yeah, I love those. I want to take that. Okay, there we go. All right, let me go ahead and get your scores for chapter four. And then we'll get back into blood pressure and practice that. And then we'll move on to today's lessons. We'll see how far we can get. All right. Did you guys read chapter four in the book and take the test on chapter four? All right. Anybody have any questions for me? Anything that you missed and you don't know why? Anything you need me to explain? I know chapter four was a bit. hard to explain. It's overly complex. It's organized, but the way that they give you the information, it's like, well, what do I need to know? You know, so um, what I really want you to focus on with chapter four, you don't need to know that um, diabetes is a disorder of the endocrine system. Nobody's going to ask you stuff like that. Yeah, nobody's going to. They're going to say everything on the state test is remember focusing on the patient. So if they ask you, you know, diabetes is a disorder of the what system that that has nothing to do with patient. Right. So. The answer would be more along the line, or the question would be more along the lines of you're caring for a diabetic patient, which of the following skills might be affected by that diagnosis. So, um, you know, making an occupied bed, probably not. Range of motion, probably not. Foot care, yes. So that's the type of content that would be related to chapter four, okay? Um, the other thing that you need to take out of chapter four and I wanted to get into this last class and it was not enough time. The other thing I need you to get out of chapter four are the normal changes of aging. So what's normal during the aging process? Well, we learned that you lose your subcutaneous fat, right? So you're gonna perceive temperature a little bit different with aging. We're also gonna learn about energy deficits with aging. We're going to learn about, um, in chapter eight, you're gonna learn that um, with the elderly population, they generally tend to eat less um, later in the day. So their biggest meal is usually earlier in the day around lunchtime. 
and then dinner, they may only eat a little bit. Um, that's normal for that population. Um, requiring less sleep, that's normal for that population. Although they also possibly take naps, right? So um, where you can't live without a solid eight or 10, <laughs> your elderly patients may be able to get by on five. You know, they go to bed and they get up at 3 a.m. because they simply can't sleep anymore or their hips hurt them or something like that. Um, and then they may take a nap in the afternoon. That's normal. Well, why would we, would we need to know normal? We do normal. That's right. And any, anything abnormal needs to be reported. If you don't know what normal is, how in the world are you going to know what to report? Right? So if we have a patient who's been getting up at three, four in the morning, getting up at three, four in the morning all the time, and over the last two days, you notice that they're sleeping way more than they normally do. It's just sleep. Is that something you should report to the nurse? Yeah. Why? It's, different. it's a change in the patient. That's right. It's a change in the patient. It could indicate a urinary tract infection. It could indicate depression. Depression is very common among the elderly. Very common. It may indicate a bacterial infection that's affected the brain. It may indicate um, meningitis. So there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, and it's up to the nurse to kind of dig in and figure out what's causing the problem. and um, work with the medical team on testing and, and things like that. Good, makes sense. So that's really what you need to understand about chapter four. But there is one more thing I wanna cover briefly. Every body system in your body is connected. So like the heart system doesn't live alone, the cardiovascular system it's gonna cooperate with other body systems. So if something goes wrong in the cardiovascular system, other systems are going to be affected. So no body system is an island. <laughs> they all have to cooperate, get along. Anybody ever been in a house with somebody who's not happy? How awkward is it? Yeah, like doors get slammed and yelling or silent treatment or right it, it you tiptoeing around don't set that person off right it's very awkward isn't it well if you have a heart attack your heart is throwing a tantrum not happy so the rest of the body systems are going to be like uh <laughs> he's not happy <laughs> and they will be affected by that condition so understanding that. Um, get your observation skills up to a little bit higher level so that, you know, if you think to yourself, oh, they just had a stroke, that's a, you know, problem with the um, cardiovascular system. I don't have to worry about anything else. You're not going to be paying attention to the changes in the digestion, digestive system that may occur, right? Or the urinary system or the musculoskeletal system, right? They're all connected. Does that make sense? So I need you to kind of understand that the body has to cooperate, has to work together like a happy family. And if somebody's not happy, the whole family's gonna know it, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and get your scores for chapter four. Jillian, how did you do? Is Jillian here? Uh, Shaylin, Tara? Thank you, Bernice. Thank you, Gianna. <laughs> Thank you. Gianna, what is the number on your yellow book? Um, one. Thank you. Uh, Bailey? Patricia? Mm -hmm. Stephanie? Melanie? Thank you, Jessica? Thank you, Cynthia? JC, thank you. Rachel, Amber, 
All right. So those of you who are joining us from YouTube world, let me pull up my chat here. Thank you, Bailey. Yeah, those of you who are joining us from YouTube world, if you're in my class, please let me know how you did on your uh, test on chapter four. Thank you, Bailey. If not, I'll just get it from you when you come back to class. All right, so we have a lot to go over with to go over today. We're not going to get to all of it, and that's okay. We'll uh, bring in, uh, we'll move some skills around as we go. But we are going to learn, we're going to finish up blood pressure. We're going to learn supported sideline position. I've got a lot of information to give you on that one. We're going to learn foot care. I have to explain a lot about diabetes for that one. Um, we're going to assist a resident with a bed pan. Maybe that's the one skill I may push off to another day. And hopefully we'll have a chance to get to range of motion shoulder as well, which is a pretty short skill. Not a whole lot to tell you. Um, so we're going to focus on blood pressure today. I'm also going to give you the state test registration forms, and we're going to go over that as well. So lots and lots to do today. Does anybody have any questions before we get started? No questions? Okay, so we're going to um, go back to page 40 for me. Or, I'm sorry, page 39 for me. And let's review blood pressure really quickly. So when we're taking a blood pressure, we're going to put the cuff around the arm. We're going to lay it on the arm, find the artery. When we feel the thumps, we're going to line up the arrow with where we felt the artery, and then we're going to secure the cuff on the arm so that it's snug. We're going to put our stethoscopes in our ears with the ear tips facing right. So make sure that that stethoscope is incorrectly. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to hear very well. Remember, this is a really small sound we're trying to pick up. A wave of blood hitting the top of an artery. Really small sound. So ear tips face the patient, put them in. We're going to put the stethoscope on the open area of the skin. Remember, you don't want to shove it underneath that cuff if you can, you know, if you can help it. Make sure it's nice and open, but squish it down really good so no air gets underneath. Then we're going to inflate the cuff. How far do we go? 180. Yep. No, no more than 180, 160 to 180. And then you're slowly going to deflate that cuff so that needle moves down. Now, you don't want that needle to stop. You want it to move at a nice, slow, controlled rate all the way to zero. Along that journey, it's going to be quiet, 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 quiet. You're going to hear a thump. Wherever the needle is, when you hear that first thump, that's your top number. You'll hear more thumps. We don't care about those. We're looking for the last clear thump. But remember, you don't know it's the last one until there's no more behind it. So you have to pay attention. So thump, 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 thump. Oh, that was the last one. And then we're going to deflate to zero, remove the cuff. Where we heard the first thump, top number, where we heard the last thump, bottom number. And remember, each one of those little teeny ticks on the dial is worth two. Okay. Good morning. So is that good? Does that make sense? Everybody remember that? We're reviewing for blood pressure. So oh, good. So now what we need to do is learn how to inflate and deflate the cuff because that's you. And we're going to use that bulb and valve assembly on our cuff, the thing that looks like a hand grenade. And we're going to practice on our cans or bottles or whatever we have. And I do have some. Oh, thank you, Bailey. I hope you feel better. I hope you feel better. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, and as somebody who catches everything, thank you for staying home. <laughs> yeah, I catch everything. I have the immune system of a slug. All right, so to do this, to practice, and all we're doing is practicing right now because your neighbor really wants to keep their arm. <laughs> You know, so we're going to practice on a can so that our neighbor likes us. So the way that we're going to do this. 
wrong way. Come back, come back. Here we go. Sorry, guys at home. So what we're going to do is take our can, bottle, container, whatever you got. If somebody needs one, let me know, and I'll, I'll, I've got some so I can help you out. Okay. Give me just a second. What we're going to do is take our cuff, and it's, you're going to face you. You have the dial face you like this. Okay. So let me turn around so you guys can see from behind. So I'm going to take this cuff where the dial's facing me, and the little bulb thing is hanging down. And I'm going to take my can. I'm going to wrap the cuff around the can. And sometimes you can lay it down and roll it. That's fine. You want to wrap the cuff around the can so that the dial is facing you. This big old flap that's hanging out here, fold it behind the can and hold it with your non-dominant hand. So I'm right-handed. I'm going to hold this whole assembly thing with my left hand. Now that's important because when you start doing blood pressures, that left hand it has a job. It has to hold the stethoscope. So I want it busy right now so you don't get used to using it. We're going to give it a job to do. It's going to hold your can. Okay. So hold yours up real quick. You have the one with the bar. Okay. So I got to get, oh, and, oh you do too. Mm. Okay. Don't know whether this is going to work. Yeah, it's it's got to be a big one for the one with the bar. So your cuffs are a little different. They don't come apart. Or they do, but you don't want to bring them apart. So you want to put this, keep it together, slide it over your can, and then I'm going to let you borrow mine for this. Uh, then you want to, that one will work because it's it's wider. You might be able to make this work. We'll give it a try. You might be able to make it work. Um, you, but we want it snug. Oh, you've also got one of those. Um, yeah, this may not work. Let me see. These cuffs, the ones with the metal bars, are designed to take your own blood pressure. They're not really designed to be used in a clinical setting. And you may find that you you may find that it's not as smooth. You may find it's not as as user friendly. Whoops. So, sorry about that. So when, um, when you're, pra it's fine for practice, but you may want to get a professional cuff for when you're working in a clinical setting. You just take a second. Nope, that is correct. Yeah, that's correct. Now, see, because it's a home kit, you don't have, like mine, I have this fabric tab thing that my gauge sets on because it's designed for me to use it on you. Yours is designed to be used on yourself. So if you had the gauge there, you wouldn't be able to read it. It's too far away. So that's why yours doesn't have the strip for the, the gauge to lay on. You would have that gauge on the table where you could easily read it. Does that make sense? So a little bit different. Um, but it's still going to squeeze the art. It's still going to squeeze the arm. Still going to squeeze the artery. I mean, it's going to check all the boxes. It just may not be as user friendly when we're learning. Okay. So now that we have our can with our cuff around it and our gauge facing us, we're going to in our dominant hand. Sure. I'm sorry. Did I miss? I'm. I missed you. I'm sorry. Can you pass that down, please? Yes. Yeah, it, it a little, that, that's fine. It's because there's a little bit of residual air. 
if you open this all the way, see how now it's in the box? Oh, well, that would be good. Yeah, we want it calibrated, but as long as it's in that box, it's considered calibrated. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I have my can with my cuff wrapped around it. I'm holding it in my non-dominant hand. So in this case, it's my left hand. And I'm gonna have my bulb and valve assembly in the right. I want this gauge to be facing me. So I'm gonna hold this with this gauge facing me. I'm gonna hold this in my hand. Do you see how I'm holding this? With the bulb in the palm of my hand and my fingers holding this little dial. This is not correct. This is, okay? So we wanna hold it so the tubing is facing up. That's because you've got to be able to hold this little dial. And you know how when you have a hand grenade, you don't wanna let it go, right? When you pull the pin, you better be keeping some pressure on it, right? Otherwise, what happens? Yeah, kablooey. So that's how we're gonna treat this. I'm gonna put this bulb in my hand and my fingers are gonna go on this dial and I'm not gonna let go. The reason is if I adjust this, these are little teeny tiny Thumbelina size motions. I mean, hairs that were moving this, tiny motions. So if I do this, if I move it and let go, when I go to grab it again, it's gonna move. And that's going to affect how fast that needle goes down. Remember we were talking on Monday? I said when we inflate, if the needle goes, Whoa! you're not going to be able to get the numbers. If you let go of that dial, when you grab it again, that needle is going to go, Whoa! and you're not going to get the numbers. So when we hold on to this silver dial, we're going to hold it. And we're going to keep holding it. So righty tidy, lefty loosey. Everybody remember that? Okay, righty, tidy, lefty, loosey. So if I'm holding this bulb in my palm and I have my fingers on this dial and it's facing me, righty, tidy, I'm gonna op or close that, that silver dial all the way until it stops, but I'm not gonna tighten it. Just until it stops, just until it stops. And then I'm going to pump it up. I'm gonna hold that silver dial with my thumb and forefinger and ever so slightly, I'm gonna move it to the left until that needle stops moving. Can you guys see my needle? Can you guys see my needle? That's about the speed that we wanna be at. Kind of like a second hand moving backwards. So you put this on camera for you. You can watch it on the screen. Okay, this is an awkward angle. <laughs> so we're gonna close that valve. We're gonna inflate to somewhere between 160 and 180. And I'm gonna move this dial ever so slightly so that needle starts to come down. See that needle moving? You see the needle moving? If that needle stops, that's me. See the needle move? That's what I'm looking for. I want a nice, slow descent all the way to zero, but it's not a crock pot. We can't set it and forget it. We're gonna open it a little bit and the needle's gonna start to move, but that needle will slow down and stop unless we open it a little more. So you have to pay attention to that needle. As it starts to slow down, we're gonna open it a little more. As it starts to slow down, open it a little more. Open it a little more open it a little more until you get all the way to the bottom. Good? You guys understand how we're doing this? Okay, remember if the needle stops, that's you. If the needle speeds up, that's you. You are in complete control over this process, which is why we're practicing on cans. Okay, so I'm gonna show you one more time here. We get a little bit closer. Hopefully it's not too blurry. A little blurry, but you can see the speed anyway. We're gonna open that dial just a tiny bit. Tiny motion. 
do that. There we go. That's what we're looking for right there. It does take some practice. I'm at a weird angle here, so it's kind of hard for me to, to fine tune it. Um, it does take some practice. So for the next five minutes, practice. Inflate, deflate. Now, when you inflate, the, the needle might start coming down a little bit on its own because it's got something to press against. That can is hard and it's pushing the air out. So it might start coming down a little bit on your own. That's okay, but practice working that gauge. Practice working the gauge. Thank you, Lisa. That was very sweet. Uh, Shaylin, thank you all. Write your scores down. Uh, good morning, Kimberly. Thank you, Patricia. I hope that your um, situation improves. All right. And Lisa, I hope you were able to see it then, uh, the last one. Okay. So now if you're trying to um, pump it up and it's not doing anything, like what's happening there, your valve isn't closed all the way. Like yeah, your, your valve isn't closed all the way. Yep. All right. Uh, Lisa, uh, let me, um, I'll do that again for you. No problem. So Lisa was not able to see the, uh, um, the needle moving. So try this again. Small motions, right? Okay, so I'm gonna close this down. Let me do it on this side, might be easier for me. Okay. Can everybody see? It is. I know it's a little bit blurry. If I get it far enough away, it's not blurry, it's hard to see. But we're gonna close that valve down. We're gonna pump it up to somewhere between 160 and 180. Oh, went too far. And I'm going to hold that valve between my thumb and index finger and turn it to the left ever so slightly. See how that needle is moving? That is about the speed I want right there. But if I don't do anything, it's going to start to slow down. See how it's slowing down? And now it's stopping. That's because I'm not opening. I got to open it a little more and a little more and a little more until we get to zero. So we'll do that one more time and we we'll close it down. I'm going to go up. We're going to open it up. And that's my speed right there. Kind of like a second hand going back. Now, this is going to look a little different when you get it on a person. That needle is actually going to tick as it comes down. It'll go tick, 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 tick. That's not the blood pressure. We're recording what we hear, not what we C. Okay, Lisa, I hope that helps. Okay, when you think you've got this down, you don't, but that's okay. When you think you do, um, go ahead and take your cuff off of your can. And we're going to put all of this together. When you're taking somebody's blood pressure, their feet need to be flat on the ground and their arm needs to be supported on a table. Don't take a blood pressure with the arm held out in midair because it will affect the blood pressure. We want that arm supported on a table. If possible, left arm is best, if possible. 
So we want to ask the patient, which arm can I use? If the patient says, I don't care, either one, we want to go with the left um, for consistency sake, because there is a little bit of a difference between blood pressure on the right arm and blood pressure on the left arm, and it has to do with the size of the hose. A smaller hose, when you turn that faucet on full force, it's going to be more pressure in there. Bigger hose, you turn the faucet on full force, it's got more room, more room to move, less pressure. So the arteries on the left side, because it's closer to the heart, are bigger. So if we want um, consistency in readings, everybody tries to go with the left. Now, if your patient has a reason we can't use the left, we're gonna to listen to them and we're gonna use the right. When you're practicing this, guys, it's really, really easy to get all caught up in, I gotta learn this, I gotta do that. And you'll take a blood pressure 15 times on the same arm. Let me try it again, just one more time. And you keep inflating that cuff over and over and over and over again. What? Yeah, it's going to get, the arm is going to get swollen. It's going to get sore. This hurts. But if you remember what I said on Monday, each time you take a blood pressure, it goes up a little bit. Yeah, because we're compressing the arteries. Well, after about the third try, the arteries start to freak out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is no good for us. And the arteries will actually, they think that trauma is occurring. Your body actually thinks there's trauma. So they're going to try to shut the arteries down to prevent blood loss. And because we're constricting the arteries, now we're getting a higher reading. We're not anywhere near accurate. So don't do that to the people you're practicing on. Our rule of thumb is twice on one arm, then move to another arm, then move to another person. You should never take a blood pressure more than three times in any person. If you can't get it in those three tries, you're not going to get it. Go find somebody else to try. And that's perfectly okay. We as healthcare workers have to understand that we have limits. You have limits, you have limits, you have limits, and all of our limits are a little bit different. I have things that I'm very, very strong in. And I have things that I might struggle a little bit with. I am not a master of everything and either are you. So if you can't get the blood pressure, the professional thing to do is to go ask somebody for help. Hey, I'm having a real hard time hearing this guy. Can you go take a listen? That's the professional thing to do. Standing there and taking a blood pressure 15 times because you're determined to get it, that is not the professional thing to do. Okay, good, makes sense. Okay, so what we're gonna do is break up into groups of two or three. So, um, and you're gonna take each other's blood pressure. So, I know. <laughs> so, so what we're going to do, what we're gonna do is you three are gonna work together and this is your chair. This is your table to support the arms so that we can work on the left arm. So one of you will sit in the chair. You'll take their blood pressure. You will then become the patient and you'll take her blood pressure. You will become the patient. You'll take her blood pressure so that everybody gets a turn. And then you're going to switch groups. I want you to take at least three blood pressures on three different people uh, in class. Okay. So, so you three are going to work together. This is your chair. So you'll be the patient. You'll take her blood pressure. You be the patient. She'll take your blood pressure. You be the patient. You'll take hers. You're going to switch groups. Okay. And then you guys are going to pair up. And... So, um, <laughs> that's good. So, yeah, if you can put the chair there. Okay. You'll take each other's blood pressure. Please remember to support the arm on the table. You'll take each other's blood pressure. You'll get done quicker, but you're going to rotate into other groups. 
okay? Just grab somebody, because there's always going to be one man out over here. So grab somebody to practice with, you know, okay? The name of the game here is practice. You're not going to feel confident or comfortable until you're about six months in. So go ahead and give it a whirl. Now, when you're doing this, you're going to realize that you need one more hand. You really don't need one more hand, but it feels like you do. So I need you to practice enough to make that comfortable. I can't find her. Okay. I will come help. Okay. Part of it is because she's got her arm lazy. We need that arm all the way out. And we're going to go right here. Now put your thumb on the back. Press down. I'm not pressing hard enough. Got it? So it, when you're doing that, if you lay this cuff on here, okay, you see these, these arrows here, when you find, just lay this here and find the artery. When you find the artery, put your thumb on the back. When you find the artery, you want to line this arrow up with where the artery was felt. And now you know exactly where to put your stethoscope. So we're going to secure this so it's snug. There you go. Are you able to hear it? Okay, you were able to hear hers. Good. <laughs> Can't hear anything yet. Keep trying. Okay. And that it everybody's gonna sound a little bit different. Some people are really, really hard to hear because there's a lot of tissue between you and the artery. A lot of muscle, fascia. Um, ligaments, right? A lot of stuff there. So hers may just be, plus we're loud in here, right? So hers just may be a little bit harder to hear. Do the best you can, let her take yours and then find a new person. This is why I want you to take three. And you're not going to hear anything. You're not going to hear anything until you inflate. Because remember, it's quiet, 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 thump, right? The thumps are in the middle. So you're not going to hear anything right, right now. Okay, I'll be right there. Okay, you're not going to hear anything. Oh, I'm not. You're not going to hear anything yet. We have to inflate. Remember that the thumps are in the middle, right? So you're at the bottom. There's no thumps right there. You also need to hold this this way so you have control over that. Are you right-handed? Yes. Okay. So backwards. So we're going to let the air out so her arm doesn't fall off. <laughs> Go ahead and put the, those in. These hurt so bad. I, so bad. I have small ears. Okay. So this is going to be held by your left hand. This is going to be held by your right. That way you can control that. So you're going to put your stethoscope here. And I'm going to help you just a little bit. This needs to move up. Remember, we want a nice, clear area. Okay, so put your stethoscope here. Squish it in. Okay, you're going to inflate your cuff. 
No, nope. righty tighty. There you go. Stay up to here. There you go. Gotta open it up a little bit, little bit, little bit, tiny bit, lefty loosey. That's okay. Keep listening. Keep listening all the way to zero. Did you hear any thumps? Okay, your stethoscope may not be sensitive enough to pick it up. Really? Yeah, that's a possibility. The those stethoscopes just aren't great quality. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> so nope, don't take that off yet. I know your arm is killing you. I know. <laughs> oh, so bad. It's so red. <laughs> My ear is my right. Okay. So you're gonna use this one. I don't want to hit you with it. Thank you. You're welcome. I know, kind of shake it out. It's <laughs> so much more comfortable to get this off. Excellent. Yeah, there's a big difference in the professional ones and the home ones. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to put your stethoscope here. Okay, you want to be right here and you want to really squish it in. And remember, you're going to hold that with your left hand. And then here. Yeah. I just want you to listen for a second. I'll control this. Just listen. Snug. All right. So now just listen. Just listen. Yeah. Okay. So now, now, you're fine. I don't care, Grace. Really. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're not getting stuck. You're good. <laughs> Did you hear any thumps? Okay. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. That's where practice comes in. Do you see the difference in the stethoscopes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Don't there you worry. Go. <laughs> Don't be like me. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus, I thought you were just I can see the back of my head. Is <laughs> no, we, we want it closed. There we go. I'm like, this buzz. No, don't open it. Don't open it. Because that doesn't let air go in. Don't let go. Keep your fingers on them. Listen. Keep opening. Keep opening. Keep opening all the way to zero. Keep opening. Don't let the needle stop. Keep opening. Don't let the needle stop. There you go. Wait, did you hear thumps? Okay. You know where you heard around near where you heard the first one? I know that's tangled in your hair. There you go. You know around where you heard the first one? Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so the first one would be where, or the top numbers where you heard the first one, the bottom numbers where you heard the last one. Hearing the thumps is all I care about today. You'll dial in the numbers as long as I know you know what to. Yeah. Okay. We want to use this. 
Okay. So um, you're free right now, right? So why don't you come over here and work with one of these babies? Okay, so let me, um, I'm gonna help you real quick. Let me have this. You're gonna put your stethoscope here and you're gonna listen. Just listen. Oh no, you didn't, you didn't actually, you didn't listen, you're good. Do you have high blood pressure? That means you should go high blood pressure. Okay. Did you hear any thumps? Uh, well, I have my finger in here. So okay. I, I always, I, the first thing is I like so. Okay, all right. So we're gonna have you try on somebody else because I think that her blood pressure might be a little bit on the higher side today, just based on what I'm seeing. So, um, and you just had coffee, so. <laughs> so we'll have you practice on somebody else. And um, the other thing is that the more tissue is there and she's got a lot of muscle. So the more tissue that's there, it's harder to hear. So we're, that's why I want you to practice on multiple people. One more arm is Uh oh. That must have been good for like a squealer in there. <laughs> hey, guys at home, if you're watching this and you like what you see, give me a thumbs up on YouTube, please. You can give me a thumbs up. That tells YouTube that you like our content. So go ahead and grab another partner. Grab another partner. Look, I got a good arm if you want to use it. <laughs> she said it looks like my whole arm's just pulsing. <laughs> Are you Sorry. free? Come on over here and work with one of these ladies or grab a new partner. We're at an odd number. I know, I know. There's always going to be an odd man out. So. Have you taken her blood pressure? Huh? Yeah. yeah, you took hers. Okay. Yeah. So I can do her. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, try that. If you oh, haven't taken hers. Yeah. Yeah, try yeah. that. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, you're on it. <laughs> 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 
That's like coming to the hospital immediately. Oh man. Yeah. No water today. Straight coffee. Yeah. So jacked up. What's happening? Oh. I know it's getting used to putting it in your ears and you know, yeah. like, oh god. I know I don't have all the that's okay it will come in time Good. Go ahead and jump in that group. Grab a new partner. Oh. <laughs> you feel that way? I'll do her. I need everybody to hear at least three. three. Okay. That was the first one. That was it. I have a good arm. Can I take yours after her? Huh? Can I take yours after her? Lost your. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh sure. Oh, okay. I didn't even see that. <laughs> I'm like. So that is. Thank you. That's where practice comes in, and this is the place for practice. Nobody in here is a professional. Everybody's making mistakes and that's okay. I had three done to me, but I have to share one more. Okay, we'll get you another partner in just a second.
Grab a new partner, guys. Make sure that you've heard at least three. More is better. If you've got time, grab an arm. On do it here. Get it all the way on. You're welcome. All right, you need one more. Okay. Okay. How many more do you need? One more. Okay. All right, so grab a new partner. We'll get this one. <laughs> Get this one uh, finished up and we're gonna move on to a new skill. It's not going to be at 180. Remember, normal is between 100 and 119. So if you're hearing it at 180, what does that tell you? Right. So it's going to be quiet all the way to the first bump. <laughs> We need to do one more. Yeah, it's going to be quiet all the way to the first thump. And wherever that first thump is, the number that the needle is pointing to, that's your top number. And hopefully it will be between 100 and 119, but it may not be. It may show up at 140 or 160 or 92. We don't know where it's gonna show up because we don't know what the patient's blood pressure is. So we're just gonna listen. We're gonna go up to 180 and we're gonna listen. Wherever on that dial we hear that first thump, that's our top number. Okay. <laughs> and your stethoscope is in backwards. <laughs> so, Go ahead and finish up your last one. Go ahead and finish up and then we're gonna jump into a new skill.
Yeah, do it before and after the roller coasters. Oh, there you go. Don't ask. Don't see what this does to you. The frustration is getting in line. Plus, it gets embarrassing at the same time. It's great. It gets embarrassing. A lot of you will see what they announced on the news last week. If you make under $50,000. Stuff it's hard to talk like, but the second one I could do. I'd really like, and then getting the arm thing off. I'm like, sorry, guys. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we good? Thanks. All right, so you're not going to be good at that today. That's okay. You're not supposed to be good at it today. You're probably not even going to be good at it next week. Takes a lot of practice to get this one down. So we're going to inflate the cuff and we're going to listen. We don't know where that first thump is going to show up. It could show up anywhere on that dial. Kind of like playing hide and seek. All you want to do is listen and pay attention to when it does show up and where the needle is on the dial when you first hear it. Patient may have high blood pressure. It might show up pretty quick. The patient may have low blood pressure, which means it may not show up for a long time. And the danger is that your brain can shut off somewhere in there. Your brain may think, oh, I didn't hear it. There's something wrong with me. I missed it. Maybe I should start over when the show didn't even start yet. You've walked out of the theater, okay? So you just inflate, deflate, and listen. Um, this, is, this is a tough one. There's a lot going on with this skill. Thankfully, it's not on the state exam. Yay, <laughs> right? But we still have to know how to do it. It's still very important to know how to do a manual blood pressure. Any questions on this? All right. So I know these are my old slides. I know you don't have the page number on there that you're used to. I didn't get a chance to redo these slides for this class today. So if you turn in your book to page 98 for me, that's where you're gonna find this page. How do we know what to do with each patient? Care plan. Care plan. So the care plan at the top of this page tells us to position the resident on his left side. Patient requires support to remain on his side and is unable to assist with turning. That's what our care plan is telling us. What side are we putting this patient on? Can I put him on the right? No. Why? Yeah, care plan says, that's right, correct. If you position the patient on the wrong side for the state exam, you could potentially fail. So it's important that you know your right from your left, especially when it comes to the patient. Because remember, my right and left is different from your right and left when I'm facing you. So this takes a little bit of attention to detail. Okay. okay. All right, supplies are easy for this one. You need a barrier. You need three pillows and we're gonna use a privacy blanket. Now for this skill, you actually don't need a privacy blanket. You could get away 
with leaving the sheet on the patient. Perfectly okay. So if you want to cut a step, cut a supply and not use a privacy blanket, go for it. The problem is that we're going to have to position this patient for turning, turn them, and then put a pillow between their legs. Now, if you've got a sheet on them and that sheet is tucked under the mattress, those three steps are going to be a little problematic. So it is easier to use a privacy blanket and pull the sheet completely off the patient. Remember, we can't have a bare patient. They have to be covered with something, right? I can't just take that sheet away. So it is easier to use a privacy blanket that gives you access to the whole patient and then restore the sheet at the end. That's why I have a privacy blanket up here. But if you want to do it with just the sheet on the bed, that's fine. You can. But it's going to make it a whole lot harder. Good? Make sense? The supplies are pretty easy. We do need three additional pillows. And that's because of gravity. Quite simply, because of gravity. When I turn a patient onto their side, gravity is automatically going to try to put them back on their back. That's because most of our weight is along the back side of our body. And gravity will pull the patient back onto their back. So I've got to have a way when I get a patient onto their side, I got to have a way to keep them there. Anybody ever play with Barbies when you were a kid? Did you ever try to put the Barbie on their side? Yeah, Barbies don't stay on their sides. They won't stay on their sides. Mannequins won't stay on their sides. Real people, if they can't do it themselves, won't stay on their sides. If they're immobile, gravity will always pull them onto their back. Good. So we're going to use three pillows to keep them in the right position and to make sure that they don't develop bed sores while they're there. So we're going to put a pillow behind their back. We're going to put one between their legs. We're going to put one under the upper arm to support it. And we're going to adjust the one under the head. So we're going to use three new pillows, but we're not going to ignore the one that's already on the bed. We have to address it as well. So if you look at this, there are 25 steps to this skill. And they give you eight minutes to get this done. This is a testable skill. The only skill that I teach you that's not on the test is blood pressure. This is a testable skill. This is actually one of my favorite skills. One of my favorite skills. Very physical. Um, and you can turn somebody three times your body size with no stress on you or them, as long as you know the right process. So it's kind of like a, a magic trick, actually. So I'm going to teach you the right process so that it doesn't injure you or them. Good? Okay, so we know what we're doing. We're turning our patient on their left side. So let's, um, before I show you this skill, let's go over a few things that are important to know about this particular skill. So we're gonna learn a new principle here. This is scoot and roll. Let's review. We've learned the skill rules. We follow the care plan. We know the opening. Every skill starts with the opening. Every opening starts with a knock. We know to use a barrier if we're going to use any supplies. We know how to evaluate if we need gloves. We're no, we know we're using a privacy blanket anytime the patient's uncovered or undressed. We know not to hold linens against our uniform. If we um, take it, we use it. If we don't use it, we lose it. You guys remember that? We've learned washing rules. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we don't add soap to the water. And um, who checks the water temperature? Patient. Yeah, both of us. Yeah, us and the patient. We know how to clean those basins once we're done with them. And we know how to end every skill with the six seats. It's good. So we've learned the majority of everything on that back wall. Now we're going to add in scoot and roll. And then um, next week, we're going to add in shoe rules. Okay, good. So after today, only one more principle to learn. And you guys just recited that back to me, so I know you know it. 
Okay. And these are the principles that are going to define everything you do for the rest of your career, whether it's as a CNA, as a nurse, anywhere in your career, these things still apply. So you're going to learn it once and use it forever. All right. So let's talk about suit and roll. The first thing you need to understand is you will not have side rails in all settings. In fact, you will have side rails in very few settings. And that's because side rails are considered a restraint. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I told you last week that patients always have to be in the middle of the bed. You guys remember me saying that? And on Monday, I actually demonstrated it to you when I had somebody go lay down in the bed and, and she actually put herself in the middle of the bed. And we talked about that, right? That's all leading up to this lecture. So you know that patients have to be in the middle and you know that they'll unconsciously put themselves there if they're able to. Now we have to talk about what happens if they're not able to, and that's on us. So the patient has to always be in the middle of the bed, even after the turn. So if I've got a patient who starts out in the middle of the bed and I'm going to turn her on her left side, I can't just walk up to her and go, okay, I'm going to turn you on your side. Try to do this without tripping. I'm going to turn you on your side and then just roll her. Because when I roll her, where does she end up? Is she in the middle? And we automatically know that that is not a good place for her. Do you think she feels comfortable? No, no. no, not at all. Now, if I let go, she's going to fall back under her back. So there's two things here that we have to be aware of. First of all, you can't just roll a patient. They're going to be too close to the bed. The second thing is after the roll, you have to have a method of keeping them in place so they don't fall. So if I need this patient to be in the middle of the bed after the turn, I'm sorry, guys at home. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, guys. All right, so to recap, if I just roll this patient, she's way too close to the edge. If I let go, she falls back onto her back. So if after the turn, I need this patient to be in the middle of the bed, I have to take a step first. And you guys do this unconsciously. You do this without even thinking about it. So let me get somebody over in that bed. Somebody go lay down in the bed. Super easy. Just lay down in the bed. I feel like everybody's staring at me. <laughs> Oh, congratulations, Denise. Denise passed her test yesterday. Congratulations. Okay. So where did she put herself? In the middle of the bed. All right. So if I asked her, can you roll so that you're facing that wall for me? Are you comfortable? If you were at home, is that how you would do it? Okay, come back onto your back. Face that wall like you were at home. How would you do it at home? If you're going to turn on your side, how do you how do you turn? Yeah. Ah, okay. So she didn't roll. She shifted. So her bottom is in the same place, just facing a different direction. Right? She shifted. Now she did this all in one turn because our bodies are able to do that. We're gonna use the same principle, but if we're doing it on another body, we have to do it in two steps, not one, okay? But the, the end result is the same, thank you. So the end result is the same. So if we come back over here, I'm gonna demonstrate on this lady. So remember we said, if we just roll, we end up near the edge of the bed, which is what she did first. And she wasn't comfortable. This patient's not comfortable either. So if I want her in the middle after the roll, I've got to scoot her toward me first. So if we scoot the patient toward us and then roll them, they end up in the middle. We call it scoot 
and roll. And the whole goal is to have the patient in the middle of the bed after the roll. Now, if I don't scoot her far enough toward me, okay, if I just scoot her a little bit and I roll her on her side and she looks like she's a little too close to the edge, should I ignore that? What do you think I should do? Yeah, put her back down. We're gonna scoot her toward us a little bit more and then roll her up on her side so that she's in the middle of the bed after the roll. This is important. On the exam, do not think that's good enough. If it triggered your brain and you realize this patient's a little too close to the edge, do not assume that the evaluator didn't see it. They did. You've got to address it. Because if you leave a real patient like that, that's gonna cause anxiety. Can you imagine for a second if you can't move for whatever reason, you got something wrong with you, you can't adjust your own position, somebody comes along and turns you and you're like this. Can you imagine the stress that this person is going to be under for the entire time they're in this position? That's cruel. That's abuse. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So there's two steps to this. Scoot toward me and roll away. Now, it's always roll away. We never roll a patient toward us. So let me show you why. And this has to do with the fact, I'm just going to remove the um, sheet for a minute. Normally, she's covered with a privacy blanket, but just to demonstrate here. If I roll a patient toward me, I roll the patient toward me. Remember I said that um, gravity is always trying to pull the patient onto their back. So if gravity starts to take a hold and is pulling the patient in this direction, I then have to stretch to try to stop that. I have no leverage. My back is going to be affected, but more importantly, I'm probably going to lose my balance and do something like this. That means I'm going to injure the patient. We don't roll a patient toward us because it increases the risk of injury. There's another reason we don't roll a patient toward us. If I roll a patient toward me, their face is now eye level with my crotch. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about at first. And that is not comfortable for the patient at all, particularly if they've ever been the victim of any sort of sexual assault. Doesn't matter that you're a female. That does not matter at all. This is uncomfortable for the patient. So we, re we remain behind the patient's behind. Good. Questions? Yes. So like during the test and you're rolling them too far that way, can you stop and say, correction, I would roll them again, or do you just do it again? Just do it again. Okay, you don't have to correct it. You don't have to correct it. I, and any correction you make really honestly should be to the patient, not the evaluator in all reality. I would, if I turned the patient, I noticed they were too close to the edge of bed. I go, oh my gosh, Ms. Jones, hold on a second. Let's get you back onto your back. I'm going to scoot you a little closer toward me and we're going to do it again. I want to make sure you're not near that edge. I'm talking to the patient. Because remember, the test is always about the patient. The evaluators don't even exist in my world. It's me and this guy. Because that's how it's going to be in a clinical setting. Right? Let me give you a little... Um, a little word on the test. Most people are nervous about testing, right? You're being watched, right? Most people are nervous. I'd be nervous. I'd be nervous because you're being watched. What you don't realize is that the test is probably the least intrusive watched you'll be. Because when you go to work, you're being watched. The, or the, uh, the patient is watching what you're doing with their body. 
and they're judging. you. The family is watching what you're doing with their family members and they're judging you. The nurse is watching what you're doing because you're doing it under their license and they're judging you. You are being watched with everything you do. So the test is probably the least intrusive watching that you'll have in your entire career. And if you think those evaluators are harsh, come take care of my mom. Okay. What kind of care do you want your mom to get? The best. The best. That's right. So does every other family member out there. Does that make sense? So don't worry about being watched for the test. And if you're making corrections, the person to make them to really is the patient. If you start to think about the test in that light, it actually becomes a little less intimidating. Good? Does that make sense? All right. Let's talk about side rails. We talked a little bit about this a um, couple of uh, classes ago, but when we have a baby, we put that baby in a crib to keep them safe because we don't want them rolling out of bed. They have no spatial awareness. They have no knowledge of gravity, right? They, this keeps them pretty safe. Now it's kind of high up because we don't like to bend. <laughs> you know, we want to, it comfortable for us to reach in and lay baby down, pick baby up. <laughs> But eventually that baby grows up and starts to stand up and climb out. Now that high crib is a danger because they have to go up and over that railing. And now the floor is way far away and it increases the risk of injury, right? So this isn't good once the patient is about, or patient, once the baby is about a year, year and a half old, we got to address this. This is no different than this. You put a patient in a bed and put side rails up, you've done the exact same thing. There is no difference. Now, if this person tries to get up out of bed, we've made it more likely that they're going to be injured. They're gonna fall from a further distance. Side rails do not improve safety. They are not used for safety. So, there's big arguments over this, huge arguments over this. And when I first became a nurse, every single patient had their side rails raised for safety. You didn't leave a bedside unless side rails were up. How many of you guys If you get up at 2 a.m. and you want to go to the kitchen for a glass of water, or a cookie, no judgment. <laughs> there is nobody standing there telling you to get back into bed that you're not allowed. You have the freedom to roam anywhere you want at any time you want because you are an adult. The only people that we restrict their mo movement on are children. And that puts us in a position of power. When you try to restrict an adult's movement, that's putting you in a position of power. You don't have the right to have power over any other adult. I do not have the right to have power over your freedom of movement. I can't tie you guys to these chairs and make you sit there for four hours. I don't have the right to do that. Now in healthcare, for some reason, we totally throw this out the window and think we have the right to do whatever we want with the people in our beds. And that couldn't be further from the truth because at what age are you willing to give up your rights? None, either are your patients. So we have to be really careful about the way we think about this. Your patients are not prisoners. They do not have the right, or they, you do not have the right to infringe upon their rights. So we have to kind of rearrange our thinking here. 
And you'll hear this word thrown around a lot, uncooperative patients. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as an uncooperative patient because the minute you label them uncooperative, you made them a prisoner. Those two words can't go together. They can't because you don't have the right to override a patient's freedom of movement. There's only three, three types of people legally that can interfere with your right of movement. Did you guys know that? There's only three people that can interfere with an adult's right of movement. Two of them are temporary. A police officer can handcuff you and put you in jail and interrupt your freedom of movement but that's temporary. Who do you have to go see? The judge. The judge is the only one that can make that more permanent, longer term. And that's because we don't want one single person to have the right to lock you away forever without any sort of due process. I've got some people on my list that I would willingly lock away forever, right? Thank God I don't have that right because I might make some poor judgments. There have to be other people involved to get me on the right path, correct? So a police officer can interfere with your freedom of movement temporarily. The other person is a doctor. A doctor can order restraints which interfere with your freedom of movement temporarily who's the only person that can make it permanent or long term a judge that is correct did i say cna anywhere in there did i say nurse anywhere in there these are restraints they interfere with a patient's freedom of movement the only person that can order this is a doctor and that's temporary now, I know some of you are going, but wait, 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 they might fall. I don't want them to fall. They could get hurt. This is keeping them safe so they don't fall. Well, why would an adult fall getting out of bed? What are some reasons an adult might fall if they're allowed to roam freely? What are some reasons? Anybody know? Medication, sure. Medication can affect their, their gait, their stability. What about conditions, right? Medical conditions. What about mental health, right? So there's a lot of reasons that this person might be unsafe. Could be, possibly. But if I put you in bed and put the side rails up, does that do anything to improve any of those things? Does that um, help you learn how to deal with the medication you're on? Does that um, override any medical condition that you have and make it go away? No, does that improve your mental health? So hold up. We just said we wanted to use these to help the patient. We're not using them to help the patient, we're using them to help us. Make sense? Side rails are a restraint. They're interfering with patient's freedom of movement and it doesn't do anything to help your patient improve. Much better, no side rails. Have the patient use the call light and help them when they use it. That improves their gait. It improves their stability. It works their muscles. It helps with their mental health. It improves their independence. It has all kinds of benefits. Side rails do not. Starting to see this? For the test, there will be no side rails. None. No side rails on the bed. In most clinical settings, there will be no side rails on the bed. If we get an order for side rails, we have to have maintenance come put them on. And that's because we can't trust you, especially on night shift. Night shift CNAs will walk around and put side rails up so their patients don't get out of bed so they can go play cards in the, in the break room. We don't trust you. And we shouldn't trust you. 
no one should have that power over another human. So we're gonna take that option completely away. Good, make sense? Yeah, there was a case here in Florida not too long ago that all the night staff in the facility, the nurses were giving the patients big doses of Benadryl and the CNAs were putting side rails up and then they literally were in the break room playing cards all night. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah, thank God my family member wasn't in that facility because it would not have been a good day. I would probably be in jail, to be completely honest with you, because nobody should have the right to abuse my family member. And I guarantee you a lot of family members feel the same way, right? So guys, there's, there's bad healthcare workers everywhere. So if you suspect something like that is going on, don't go along to get along. That's somebody's family member that's being abused. Make sure that you're reporting it, okay? I don't like to create snitches, but if it's warranted, somebody's got to stand up for the patients because you're going to be a patient one day. We got to change things before I get there, guys. Like, seriously, I'm not that far off. <laughs> Let's change the system. All right, so there's a difference between side rails and positioning rails, though, and this has to be discussed. So side rails go along the entire length of the bed. It prevents the patient from getting out of bed. The so side rails are the long rails go along the entire length of the bed. Most places have two different uh, levels here. They've got a top side rail and a bottom side rail. So I'm going to take you over to this bed and show you what I mean. So there's two different side rails. This is a top rail. Notice it has handholds. This is actually called a positioning rail, not a side rail. It's a positioning rail because it allows the patient to use these handholds to move around in bed, turn themselves over, boost themselves up, get themselves situated. It's designed for the patient to use, but it doesn't interfere with their ability to get out of bed. Notice there's nothing down here. They can swing their legs out and move about the country as they wish. This, if I put this one up, it now becomes a side rail because I'm interfering with patient's pos uh, position, you know, freedom. So if this patient now wants to get out of bed, they have to go through this small space or scoot all the way to the end and try to get out of that space, or they might go over. Any one of these could potentially damage the patient. So this is a side rail. This alone is a positioning rail, okay? Now, if the bed is in motion, moving down the hallway to another room, we do want side rails to keep all arms and legs inside the moving vehicle at all times, right? We don't do that much anymore. Uh, back in the day, we used to move these beds all over the place. This thing weighs about 700 pounds and it's all wheel drive. So like all four wheels go in different directions at the same time. So you're, it's real easy to run into walls and all kinds of stuff because you don't have a lot of control over it. We don't do that much anymore. Now, most of the time we transfer patients onto a stretcher or into a wheelchair and take them where they need to go, put them in a new bed. We don't really move these things around because they're too heavy and the risk of injury is pretty high. But you do need to know that if this bed is in motion, you do need side rails because chances are you're running into a wall or the elevator or IV poles or patients or wheelchairs or all kinds of stuff. Tell you the funniest one I saw. Thankfully, it was an empty bed. Um, I was working in a hospital over in Orlando and they uh, had a new um, wing and there was like a walkway, like a enclosed walkway between the two wings. And there was a height difference. 
So when you went from one of them to the other, the, the slur kind of sloped down, leveled off and then sloped down. And it's 700 pound bed. It's got some momentum to it. So yeah, you'd be going along and you hit that, that decline and not realize that that decline was there and the bed would just go Woo! like a ride. So yeah, the, the bed slammed into the wall at the end of the, because the, the corridor teed off, slammed into the wall at the end. Thankfully, there was no patient in the bed, but I mean, that could have caused some injury if there was. So yeah, it does happen. All right. So any questions on positioning reels? Do you guys know the difference? All right. So let me explain to you a little bit about immobile patients. So everything I'm going to talk to you now is on page 96. Everything I just told you is on page 94 and 95. Let's go to page 96. All right. So our patient, the care plan for this particular skill does not tell us our patient is immobile. Immobile means can't move on their own for whatever reason. This patient doesn't say anything about it being immobile, it just says they can't turn on their own. So we have to understand that unable to turn is not immobile, two totally different things. But we do have to spend some time talking about immobile patients. Can you imagine for a second if you weren't able to do anything on your own, you could not move? on your own. Everything would have to be done for you, everything. But immobility has a particular effect on the skin and it's all because of gravity. So while I'm talking to you, I'd like you to take one hand and sit on it, put it under your leg. And I'm going to ask you to keep your hand there for the next two minutes, just two minutes. You're gonna to wanna to pull it out because it's gonna get uncomfortable. But bear with me, because I want to show you something really quickly, okay? So two minutes. So we have to understand that gravity on planet Earth is pulling your body weight down through the lowest point of your body. So right now when I'm standing, my entire body weight is being pulled down through the soles of my feet. That's a lot of weight in a very small area. So I get uncomfortable standing here for a few minutes, right? Because all of my body weight on that area. So I'll put one foot up or I'll shift my weight or I'll walk around, but I'm moving to try to redistribute that weight so that one part of my body isn't taking all of the brunt of it. Make sense? If I'm sitting like you guys are, all of your body weight, is being pulled down through your butt and your, your legs, your thighs. All of that weight is being pulled down through that. So you get uncomfortable and you shift. You cross and uncross your legs. You kind of situate yourself in the chair. You're waiting for breaks so you can get up and stretch a little bit, right? So you're always redistributing your weight. And there's a reason for that. Because as your body weight gets pulled down, whatever surface is the lowest point is being affected. Your muscles are being compressed by that body weight. The bones are pressing down on your um, capillaries, which is how blood gets distributed. Your um, muscles themselves aren't getting good blood flow. Nerves are being compressed. There's a lot of really um, serious consequences to this. Now you guys are probably getting a little bit uncomfortable, right? You've got about 20 seconds left. You want to pull your hand out, but don't, not yet. I want you to imagine for a second that you are immobile and you can't pull your hand out. You can feel the discomfort, but you're unable to alleviate it. This has only been two minutes. How uncomfortable do you think it's going to be in two hours? Go ahead and remove your hand and take a look at it. I want you to look for color changes. Anybody have any color changes? 
but look really closely. Do you have, can you see the imprint of the fabric of the chair or the fabric of your clothing? Can you see that? Guys, that was two minutes. Imagine how deep those lines are gonna go in two hours. Imagine how deep those lines would go in eight. Over time, if this imprinted your skin in two minutes and you guys are healthy, if this imprinted your skin in two minutes, after a couple of hours, as those lines get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into your skin, it will eventually cut your skin. And that is called a bed sore or a pressure sore or a decubitus ulcer. Remember I said in medicine, we have multiple names for the same thing. Bed sore is a pressure sore, is a decubitus ulcer, and this is how they are formed. So we wanna make sure that the surface the patient is laying on, if they can't move on their own, is as wrinkle free as we can get it. Remember we talked about that with making an occupied bed. We also wanna make sure that we're turning our patients at least every two hours around the clock. How would we know how often they need to be turned? The care plan. So this is minimum, minimum of two hours. If I've got a patient that has a lot of comorbidities or a lot of complications, I may have on the care plan that we change their position every hour around the clock. A lot of work but it's necessary to maintain the skin integrity and the circulation of the patient. So the way this works is that our patient starts out on their back. We turn them on their right side. They're gonna stay there for two hours. When we come back at the end of two hours, we're gonna put them back on their back for two hours. At the end of that two hours, we're gonna go to their left side and then back to their back, right, back, left, back, right, back, left, back. So we're gonna do this every two hours around the clock. Now, most settings will have a turning clock. If you have an immobile patient, there will be a turning clock on the wall, just similar to this, that will tell you, okay, well, it is now what, uh, quarter till 11? So at a.m., so um, the patient should be up until 11 o'clock on their left side. What do I need to do it? I'm sorry, back up. Um, Cause this is nine. Yeah, so at 10 o'clock, they went back onto their back. So we're at 1045. So this patient would be on their back. Where are they gonna go next? Left side. Wow, that worked out well for our care plan. All right, so everybody go with this. You may have a turning clock like this on the wall. Make sure you're following it, but this lets everybody know. Anybody can look at this, look at the time it is, see is the patient on the correct side. Accountability. Good? Yeah. Now notice that none of this is on their stomach. You guys see that? Right side, back, left side, none of it is on their stomach. That's because when you put a patient that's immobile on their stomach, they may not have enough muscle strength or nerve innervation to be able to expand their chest to let air in. Because when you're on your stomach, remember everything is pressing down, which means that your lungs may not inflate and you can suffocate your patient. Yeah, so you only put a patient on their stomach if the care plan specifically requires it. Now we did find out during COVID that patients on ventilators with COVID did better when we had them in a prone position or on their stomach. So a lot of uh, care plans during COVID for patients on ventilators had the patient on their stomach every so often. And that would have been reflected in the care plan. You guys starting to see how important this care plan is? because it's not one size fits all. I can't give you one rule 
that's going to cover every patient you see other than the ones on the back wall. Good. Everything else is dictated by the care plan, and that's why it's principle number one. So if we're going to turn a patient onto their side, we have to position them properly. Remember I said you can turn somebody three times your body weight as long as you're positioning them properly? The way this works, remember, we're always going to turn a patient away from us. We're going to remain behind there behind after the turn. So if I'm going to turn this patient on to their left side, I've got to be on the right side because I'm going to turn them away from me. Farthest arm goes up, closest arm crosses the chest. So the patient's going to look like this if I'm turning them on their left side. If I were going to go to the right, I would be over here. Farthest arm goes up, closest arm crosses the chest. Good. Now, moving on to the legs, you're going to bend the closest knee up and put the foot flat on the bed. You're going to angle the furthest knee out. So when you do this, the patient's already kind of half on their side. And we haven't even turned them yet. So arm up, arm cross, knee bent, knee angled. Arm up, arm cross, knee bent, knee in. When you do that, you just put a hand on their shoulder and hip and you roll them very gently onto their side. No stress, no pain for them, no struggle for you, no injury for either. Good. And then we're gonna use some pillows to keep them there. We're gonna put a pillow behind the back in a roll. We're gonna put a pillow between the legs, specifically between the knees and the ankles because we don't want those bones rubbing together. We wanna to put a pillow under that top arm so that it's elevated and relieves the pressure along the neck and into the head. So there's no headaches, muscle spasms. And we wanna adjust the pillow under the head to make sure it's under the head and neck and not that shoulder. Now we have to do our closing here and we're gonna to have to give this patient the call light and this actually counts. We want to make sure that the call light is on the side that we turned the patient toward. We don't want it behind them. Okay? And we actually want to put it in their hand so they can use it. Good. Questions? Make sense? This is going to take you, somebody with your level of experience, up to eight minutes to do. It really only takes me about four, five, maybe. I'm going to show you the video for this one, and then we'll take a quick break. So here are our checkpoints, things that we need to make sure that we do. We're going to put the, we're going to scoot the patient toward us. Remember, they have to scoot toward us, or we have to move them toward us so that they're in the middle of the bed after the turn. For the test, you can just ask them, can you scoot toward me? Remember, it doesn't say they're immobile. It just says they can't turn. For this arm up, Closest arm crosses, closest knee bent, throw this knee angle, roll them onto their side. Pillow behind the back, pillow between the legs, specifically knees, ankles. Pillow under that top arm to support it. Adjust the pillow under the head. Call light in hand on the side you turn them toward. Okay. All right. Go ahead and watch this, and then we're going to take a break. Hello. Hi, Mr. Johnson. Hi, I'm Mr. Day. How are you? Good, how are you? Wonderful. Please turn your left side. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain for privacy. I'm going to go wash my hands, get my supplies, and then I'm going to go to the bathroom. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
and I'll be right back. Okay. Start gathering your supplies. We'll start with the barriers. I'll place on the table to provide a clean area to place my supplies. And I'll get three pillows from clean supply cabinet, being careful not to allow them to touch my uniform. Since you're done, put a replacement blanket over you, and this will help keep you warm and protect your privacy while we do this today. I have the blanket in place, and I'll pull the sheet down underneath the blanket, making sure the patient remains covered at all times. Okay, Mr. Jones, if I can have your suit for me, please. I'm going to place your furthest arm above your head. And cross the closest arm over your chest. I'm going to bend the closest knee and put the foot flat on the bed. And I'm going to angle the furthest knee out a little bit. Now I'm going to turn you onto your side. One, two, three. I'm going to take the first pillow and put it at an angle up against the back, and I'm going to tuck this top edge underneath the patient by pushing down on the pillow and under his back. This edge will roll up, and then it too will be pushed down and under, forming a roll along the back. Okay, now I'm going to position the pillow between the two legs by lifting the top leg and laying the pillow lengthwise between the two legs, specifically between the knees and the ankles, to prevent those bony areas from rubbing together. This pillow is going to be placed underneath the upper arm. This will help keep the arm in a neutral position as the patient remains on the side. And then I'm going to adjust the pillow underneath the head to make sure that it's not under the shoulder. It remains only under the head and the neck. And then move the arm to a more comfortable position. Is that comfortable, Mr. Jones? Yes. Okay, I'm going to place the collar directly in your hand. Are you comfortable? Yes. Can I get you anything else while I'm here? No. Okay, please pull your sheet up. Be careful not to dislodge all of those pillows that they contain. I'll roll the privacy blanket up and place it in dirty blanket. Barrier will be thrown away. Mr. Jones, I'm going to open your privacy for now. Is there anything else I can get to you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, I'll see you soon. Let me go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review all the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator if my skill is done. Any questions? Any questions on that? Please the pillow. Yeah, the, and the back pillow is yeah, a little it's... bit trickier than it looks. That's when you're going to need a little bit of practice. And the nice thing is, if you've got a live patient at home, you can practice this skill. It doesn't, all they got to do is lay there. You know, it's pretty easy to get somebody to practice this on. And when you get them in that position with all those pillows, oh, it's the most comfortable you'll ever be. It, everything is, is just supported and cradled, and uh, you'll settle in for a nice long nap. <laughs> so it's not hard to get somebody to practice on. All right, let's go ahead and take our break. When we get back, we'll get into quick care.
Yeah. Well, for the rain and not many people. Do you want to buy any flashcards? Yes. I have an open up there, so that's what I was going to ask. Them. How they work. Yeah, I have a office appointment today. Studies afterwards, so I probably didn't. Oh, you bought them? Yeah. How were they? Did you did yeah. you use them yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, what can we do? Look at them then, it's a reasonable price. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they work really good when you're doing the book thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody that. Yeah, they're really good. They're really good. Yeah. Let's start running again, too. Your thoughts. That's fine. On Wednesday to get the month. Okay. 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 Okay.
the flashcards. They look like they're involved. Yeah, they're they're really good. They're worth it. They're cheap. I mean, yeah, only like twelve bucks. Oh, yeah. I think that's like 15. Oh, okay. Okay. Like a dollar pack. Dollar pack. And then it was a game that I saw that was a game. Yeah, the total was 15 dollars, but it was it didn't help though. Yeah, that's right. Well, too much to use them. Too much to use them. Well, you're not going to cost a couple of them. You know, just like you said. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, especially if you're in the field and you can come back something. When you do something on somebody, you can refer to them. Mm -hmm. Like, here, you do it right. Uh, I don't see a timer. Oh, yeah, you can't put the timer on. Yeah, I don't see a timer. Are you getting that email now? Yes, finally. I'm not still not getting it. I finally got it because she did it like twice. So I finally got it. Yeah. Like, oh, finally. I haven't gotten it since I haven't gotten any since Wednesday. I don't have Wednesdays, Mondays, and I probably don't get today. I still got yesterday. Yeah, it was early. Yeah, I finally got it. I was like, okay. Well, I'm in the course one, um, and then the ebook. I still don't have the ebook. It's PDF. So I don't have the ebook, and then I don't get the after class email. Oh really? Yeah. That's what I when she hooked me all up. I got that. Yeah. I still don't have that. I need to let her know, but I'm still not getting those. Yeah, I was early. I thought to try and give her a different email. That might be even easier. Oh. I mean. But I didn't know if it would interfere with the things I'm doing now. If it would mess those up with a different email. I guess her. Yeah, I need to get her on top of that. <laughs> yeah. I've never called in here. It's like today. a jack, yeah. It's like hospital temperature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you work back here? Where? No, it's not Friday. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I go back in. Go back in on Friday at 8 p.m. That's good. You get a little break. Yeah. Yeah, but I stay up here until I go back to work. Then I then I go back to Bushnell on Friday. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I live in Bushnell. <laughs> wow. I stay with a friend up here to do class. Hey, that's good. So then I go home. Give yourself props. Bettering yourself. Yeah, I go home on Thursdays, and then I stay there till uh, 
I go to work on Sunday, and then I stay, come up here Monday. <laughs> it saves me traveling from Bush now to here. You know, it has two more weeks. Yeah, so. Saves me traveling. Right. It's like an hour trip. No. From Bush now to here. Oh. I just over the sun. And you didn't want to do it online, right? No. I'd rather in person. So. I, I, I want to, well, I live in Bush now, so the, the internet's not very good mm -hmm. up there because I live on a 50 acre farm. Nice. Like up there. Nice. So it's all horses and cows and. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> that's fun. So there's not much. The internet's not very good out there. So. Now we just stay up here. So. That's what it's good for. That's good. But like, well, it's much better in person anyway than you trying to do it. I think so. Online. I'm more of a hands on person. Yeah. So I'm like, it's okay. Just stay up here. I think I would get bored online. <laughs> I, I've taken online classes and they're like, get bored after a while. Like seeing it live and yeah. so. sorry, whoever heard me say that online, <laughs> right? Right, sorry, guys. Well, done. <laughs> well, everybody's different, you know, some people can do it, and, you know, power to them. <laughs> Making a graduation yeah. mm, I don't think so. Yeah, I think she just takes a picture and that's it. Oh. I don't know if you guys know. I don't know. As long as she take, she'll take a picture. That's wonderful. I know my kids would be proud. That's all <laughs> they would. Finally, go back to school now that they're older. So you were smart doing it, girl. I give you props. <laughs> How old are you? I just turned twenty. Oh wow! Well. I had my son when I was twenty-one, so I get it. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely hard. But I went from a manager position to having to drop down to part time because of my kids because I couldn't work half the time. So now my mother-in-law is watching me while I'm at school here. And You're bettering yourself. Job. That's awesome. I think that's awesome. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to be like me and wait till they're teenagers and go yeah. back to school. Oh, yeah. I was the same age as you when I had my, my son, so. Yeah. Do it now. Yeah. Don't wait. She's smart. Get it. Because I couldn't, like. Yeah. By the time I was 22, I had two kids, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't go back to school yet. <laughs> yeah, because I was talking to my dad. I was like, well, there's, like, I just don't want to be stuck already helping myself. Because I'm right now selling cosmetics and stuff like that. I was a cosmetics manager. Awesome. And I was like. I love cosmetology, like all that, but then I was like, I was so fascinated by the whole nursing, like the science stuff and everything. My dad was like, well, get this, then go do cosmetology on the side. And I was like, yeah, yeah but and that's another whole school that I have to do. Right, right. So I'm like, okay. Now that has to play into everything else. So. Hey, you're better It's just getting yourself. a lot of certifications and everything like that. That's good. Just trying that now. You're, you're still a young, young, still yeah. young mama, so that's good. Go for it. It's just finding the time for everything. I get it. That's why now I'm doing it. <laughs> now that they're one graduated, I was like, good. I have to. Why I have a question for you? I have some answers. <laughs> I'm still not getting your email. Really? I haven't got any yet since Wednesday. Last Wednesday. You didn't get Mondays. Yeah, I didn't get Wednesday, I didn't get Mondays, and I probably won't get to that. So, um, is it possible to try a different email? Sure, I can put a different email in. Will it mess up my other stuff? Yeah. No, I can just change your email and resend. 
So at the end of class, if you want to give me a different email, oh, okay. I'll um, put that in for you. Okay, we can do that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Yeah, Yahoo, um, they're, they're kind of a tough nut to crack. Their filters are pretty. Well, I didn't know if it would mess up the course thing. Um, no, because you'll, you're, no. Okay. You'll still log in like you normally do to okay. the course. That, that won't be affected. Okay. I'm just going to change your, your email in your user account, the, the account we use to send emails out. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. All right. Does anybody have any questions about um, sideline position? No, but we can stay after next week. Right? Yes, I know. We're starting to get into some big skills now. And it's it, the complexity is going up. So, um, we don't have a whole lot of time in class to be able to practice. Now, next week, we should have a little bit. Um, the following week, we'll, you'll have a little bit more. But yes, this room is available to you until 4 o'clock on class days. So make friends, grab a pizza, <laughs> and practice. Okay. Yep. All right. So let's move on. Let's go to page 84. And our care plan on page 84 tells us to provide foot care to one foot using soap and water. How many are we doing? One foot. What if the patient has two? One foot. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We're just going to do one. The resident is sitting in a chair and their sock and shoes should be replaced at the end of the skill. Let me explain why it says that. Most care plans are not going to say this. This is specific to the test. And that's because if you look at the very bottom of the page, you're going to see that this is done on a live testing student. You might be a patient for foot care. And I know most of you are going, uh, no. <laughs> I don't want anybody touching my feet. I'm super ticklish. The answer is no. And I'm going to tell you the answer is not no. Because if some, if you get assigned to do foot care, you have to be able to do foot care in order to complete your test. If all of these people said no, you can't take your test. You think that's going to make the evaluators happy? Um, Where do they want to be? Um, there you go. If they got to argue with you guys about having skills done, you're, you're keeping them away from their pool and they're not going to be happy campers and you don't want an unhappy evaluator when you're about to test. So be cooperative. In fact, the registration paperwork I'm going to give you today, you're actually going to sign that you agree to be a patient. Okay, that's part of the registration packet. Good? All right. So if we have patients that are our students, you're going into the testing center with shoes and socks on because you're wearing them to the, the uh, testing center. The only... Um, when you go test, the only requirement for clothing is that you have closed-toed shoes and socks on. That's it. They don't care if you wear scrubs, jeans, shorts, leggings. They, they don't care. None of that is, is relevant, but you do have to have shoes and socks on, closed-toed shoes and socks. They can be slip-on shoes. That's fine. But they have to be closed-toed shoes and socks, no sandals, no high heels. Believe it or not, cowboy boots are actually meet the criteria. <laughs> I don't recommend them. But you have to have shoes and socks. Now, when we're doing this skill on another testing student, they're going to be positioned in a chair, and the evaluator is going to tell them, take a shoe and sock off. Pick one. Don't care. Just take one shoe and sock off. So you're going to take your shoe and sock off, and you're going to put it right next to your chair. 
And that's how you're going to start the skill. The uh, person performing the skill is going to go in. They're going to do foot care. We're going to get to that in a minute. And then they're going to take that same shoe and sock and put it back on the person. You're probably not taking clean socks in your back pocket with you to a, a, a testing center, right? All you have are the socks you came with, which is why it says to replace the shoe and sock at the end of the skill. In a clinical setting, when you do foot care, you're going to get a new clean pair of socks to put on the patient because clean feet deserve clean socks. We don't have that in the testing center. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. All right. So this care plan is designed specific for testing. It won't ever say that in a clinical center. Are you okay? Oh my gosh. Yeah, you'll see me kind of go crazy if that comes near me. <laughs> All right. So foot care is remarkably similar to hand and nail care, same step. There's a couple differences here. When we did hand and nail care, we soaked the hand, took it out to wash, put it into rinse, took it out to dry. We're gonna do all that again. For hand and nail care, we cleaned under the edges of the nails and we filed the rough edges. We're not going to do that with feet. We don't do toenails. We don't trim them. We don't file them. We don't clean them. We don't do anything with toenails other than look at them. Because every facility, long-term care facility has a podiatrist that comes in about once a month. And the podiatrist does not go room to room and ask, do you need me? Do you need me? Do you? They don't do that. They go in, they get a list, they see the patients on the list, and then they leave. The only way for your patient to get on the list is for you to do foot care, notice there's an issue, report it to the nurse, the nurse puts the patient on the list, the podiatrist sees the patient. So you're not doing anything with toenails except for looking at them. So if you see that they need to be trimmed or filed or ground down or cleaned or anything like that, you need to report it to the nurse. If you notice anything on the skin, Wounds, rashes, sores, anything like that, you need to let the nurse know. So the big part about this skill is not washing the foot. That's an excuse to be there. The big part of this skill is observation. So during the skill, you actually have to say something out loud, like I'm looking at the foot. I don't see any abnormalities with this foot. The skin and nails look good on this foot. <laughs> you wanna say something that lets those evaluators know that you know why you're there, that it's not about the cleaning. The cleaning is an excuse to observe. Okay. Now I'm gonna tell you years ago, this is a new skill. Foot care's only been around for about eight or nine years. And the reason is before this, we used to tell all of our CNAs, make sure you're looking at patients' feet every shift. You've got to look at their feet every shift. And the CNAs, being CNAs, would walk into a patient's room and they would do something like this. Oh my gosh, like I don't have enough to do. She says, I got to look at your feet every shift. Yeah, you got feet. I don't know why I had to do that. No. <laughs> that didn't help right? Where you're not looking at the feet to make sure that somebody didn't steal them. <laughs> they're there. I promise you they're there. You're looking at the feet to see, are there any problems with the feet? Now, this is a little bit hard for younger people to understand because you guys are all bendy. You can still look at the bottom of your feet because you bend that way. You aren't so bendy when you get older. Remember those normal changes of aging, right? Well, less bendy is way up at the top of the list. So older people may not be able to see the bottom of their feet. And if they've got a little weight on them, they may not be able to see the top of their feet either. 
And if nobody's looking at their feet, problems can happen, right? But this is a particular problem when we have somebody with diabetes. So let's talk about diabetes. What I'm going to explain to you right now is a fifth grade watered down oversimplified version of diabetes. People spend literally years understanding diabetes. It is a specialty that takes about six years of study to master. I have about 15 minutes. So this is super simplified, but it gets the point across, okay? So every cell in your body needs fuel to run, every cell. And the most abundant source of fuel is sugar. It works well. You eat carbs, those carbs break down into sugar. Those sugar molecules feed the cells. It's a beautiful system. You know, carbs get a bad rap in our society. They really do. People say low carb, no carb, right? Carbs are bad. Carbs are not bad. Carbs provide energy for yourselves. Carbs are not bad. Carbs in excess are bad. And in America, we know all about excess. <laughs> And this starts way early in life, way early in life. You know, diabetes um, is pretty common to develop when you're in your 60s and 70s. A lot, about half of our population over 60 is either pre-diabetic or diabetic. And a lot of these people will say, I've never had diabetes before. I don't understand what changed. Well, you didn't develop diabetes based on what you ate this week. You're, you develop diabetes based on what you've eaten over the last 60 years. So let me explain to you why, how this works. And it starts when you're a kid. So when you're a little kid, two, three years old, you get up early in the morning. Mom's not quite ready to get up yet. And mom hands you a Pop-Tart and lays down on the couch, turns on TV for you, and you're going to watch some cartoons while mom takes a little cat nap and gets up a little more civilized. Uh, hour. So child is eating a Pop-Tart. Pop-Tarts are carbs. Those carbs are going to break down into sugar and go into the bloodstream. Mom gets up, makes the child a bowl of cereal, right? Children are not eating all bran. What are they eating? Fruit Loops, Captain Crunch, Fruity Pebbles. Yeah, yum, right? All the good stuff. Those are all carbs, which break down into sugar and go into the bloodstream. And then we have lunch. Lunch is going to be the national toddler diet of chicken nuggets and mac and cheese, which are carbs that break down into and goes into the bloodstream, right? Afternoon snack, mom's good mom. She's going to give the child some fruit. Fruit is also a carb that breaks down into and goes into the Okay, dinner, we're gonna have some spaghetti. Child does not like red sauce, so spaghetti. You'll put a salad on the side. They're gonna promptly ignore that. And they're gonna have some spaghetti noodles. Spaghetti is carbs, which breaks down into and enters the, okay. Before bed, we're gonna give the child some sort of dessert, which is always a sweet something, which is gonna break down into and go into the, you guys starting to see this? Okay. So it is a lifetime of sugar intake. Now, why is that a problem? Well, we have to think about the sugar itself and what it takes to get that sugar into the cells. And that's what we're going to talk about now, because this is how diabetes develops. When you eat carbs and as carbs break down into sugar and go into the bloodstream, the sugar molecules themselves can't get into the cells. The cells are locked. In order for that sugar to get into the cell, it has to have a key. That key is called insulin. So when you take in carbs, your body breaks them down into sugar, puts the sugar into the bloodstream. It also has to tell your pancreas, hey, we need some keys. So the pancreas ramps up production, creates some insulin. The insulin goes into the bloodstream and now we can open the cells to get the sugar to go in. Good? All right, let's just go back to that three-year-old for a second. Pop-tarts, pancreas had to produce insulin. Cereal, 
pancreas had to produce insulin. Uh, after, or morning snack, pancreas had to produce insulin. Lunch, pancreas produced insulin. Afternoon snack, pancreas produced insulin. Dinner, pancreas produced insulin. And dessert, pancreas produced insulin. We are overworking our pancreas. And we do this day after day after day after day for your entire life. Eventually your pancreas is gonna go, dude, I'm done, done. Uh, yeah, you've overused me, I'm clocking out. So now we've got sugar in the bloodstream but no keys to open the cells. And that's how this becomes diabetes. So let's talk about that sugar. Right? So if we don't have keys to open the cells, that sugar, something's gotta happen to it. You can't excrete sugar. You have to use it or we're gonna store it, but we can't get rid of it. So when you take in sugar, it's either gotta go into the cells and be used or it's gonna circulate in the bloodstream or we're gonna pack it away in fat cells in a process called glycogen. So basically we take the sugar, we put it into a box, we tape up the box, that box is called glycogen. And then we put the box in a storage unit called a fat cell. Eventually all your storage units are full. So now if the cells can't use it, it's just going to circulate. Now, have you ever had a cake or a cupcake that you left out on the counter for a couple of days? that has frosting, what happens to the frosting? It's hard. Sugar is a crystal. So the oil and the sugar separate. And that's why the sugar gets hard, right? So sugar is a crystal. That is what's on the inside of your arteries circulating. Now, over time, remember gravity? We've talked a lot about gravity, right? Over time, gravity, is going to cause these sugar molecules to settle. So they're gonna coat the insides of your arteries. That's gonna keep your arteries from being able to expand adequately. So let me show you, maybe. This is a crystal. This is what sugar looks like on the inside of your arteries. See how it's sharp and jagged and kind of poking all over the place? Well, as this coats the inside of your arteries, it's gonna catch whatever happens to be floating by because it's sharp and pointy. So cholesterol, which looks like pizza cheese floating through your arteries, is gonna get all tangled up in that. It does, but it's also gonna shred cells. Well, we kind of need blood cells to carry oxygen. And we kind of need white blood cells to fight off infection. And if they're getting shredded by these sharp things on the inside of our arteries, that's gonna create a big gloppy gloopy mess. And we're not gonna get good oxygen where we need it. And we're not gonna get good healing things where we need them. So if we have an injury, it might be harder to heal but it gets worse. So when we're born, our arteries look like this. Man, I wish I had arteries like this again. Wide open, no obstructions in sight. This is going to allow for great blood flow, clean. But our diet doesn't keep our arteries like this. So this patient, when we need more blood flow, like if we're exercising or doing something, the artery, it's nice and clean, it can expand for more blood flow. Or if we need to close the artery down a little bit because of trauma or because of um, it's cold outside, right? We wanna pull all of our heat to our middle. These arteries can contract because they're in good shape. But if we keep our diet up the way that we do, uh, by the time we're in our teens, it looks a little bit more like this. You can see that that artery is a little smaller in diameter. We've kind of reduced our ability to accommodate for changes. So you can also see a little bit of buildup in there. 
Now, this is probably going to show up as a little bit elevated blood pressure. Nothing to be concerned about. It's a little higher than we used to be because the hose is smaller. Now, if we don't do something here and work in a few salads with like oil and vinegar, not ranch, okay? If we don't do something here, then we end up with this. Now, this is significantly blocking a lot of our artery. You can see the cholesterol that got all wrapped up in those crystals. You can see that, you know, some of our blood cells aren't going to make it through. This is a problem. This is going to be high blood pressure, delayed healing. But the real problem here is that if blood slows down or stops, it's going to clot. It has to clot. That's what keeps your body from bleeding out when you get a scratch. So if blood slows or stops, what does it do? That's what the inside of a diabetic patient's artery is going to look like. That blood has slowed down. So what did it do? Yeah, and that caused it to, is anything going to get through there? We have circulation problems. We have lack of blood flow. We have lack of healing. We have cells that aren't getting nutrition. We have problems. Capital P, problem. Now, this patient didn't develop diabetes at 60. They've been working on it their entire life but now we're seeing the effects of it. And it's really hard to backtrack and fix. Because there's nothing that I can do to, to go inside every single artery and clean that out. You guys see how this is a problem? Okay. So if we know that patients with diabetes are gonna have circulation issues, they're gonna have healing issues, um, they're going to have a lot of skin issues as well. We have to start paying attention to their skin, particularly skin they can't see themselves, like the bottom of the foot or under skin fold. You know, like if we got a big tummy and it's folded over, they may not be able to see the area under that skin fold. Make sense? So that's where we come in. And that's why inspecting the surface of the skin is so important when it comes to caring for diabetic patients. That's why foot care exists. So this is how the, the process works. The cells tell the brain, hey, I'm starving. The brain says, oh, we need some fuel. So the brain triggers a craving. You go eat something. The pancreas produces insulin. The insulin opens the door, the sugar goes in, and now the cell is happy and fed. Life is grand, as long as the pancreas is holding up its end of the deal. The problem is that when we overuse the pancreas, it just quits. So the cell says, I'm starving. The brain says, okay, let's hit a craving. So you get hungry, you go eat, but the pancreas is not producing peas. So a little while later, cell says, hey, dude, I'm still starving here. Brain says, huh, that's weird. I already fed you. But okay. Triggers another craving. You eat. More sugar goes into the bloodstream. And the brain says, okay, I think we're done here. But the pancreas didn't produce any insulin. So that sugar can't get into the cells. A little while later, says, dude, I'm starving. The brain says, oh. Well, let me get you some food. So triggers a craving, you eat, more sugar goes into the bloodstream. So eventually we get to a point where we get all kinds of sugar in the bloodstream, but the cell is still starving. That cell will eventually die because it wasn't able to get the fuel that it needed. Anybody ever know a diabetic? What do they crave? Sugar. This is why they're craving sugar. Their cells are dying. 
it's not that they have no willpower, that they just like M&Ms better than they like their health. That has nothing to do with it. They are responding to a very real emergency inside their body. Their cells are dying. And the only thing the brain can think of is let's get some fuel on board so the brain triggers a high sugar content craving. Candy, donuts, M&Ms, cookies, those types of things. It's not going to help because you can take all the sugar in you want. It, the problem is we got to get it in the cells. Now, the good news is, and it is good news. Oops, let's go back here. It is good news. On the back side of, I thought I had a slide on there. No. On the back side of every cell or, or somewhere in the cell is a small little back door. Not as big as the front door small little back door. That door is opened with protein. Now it's not as efficient, but it does work. So when we have diabetic patients that are craving sugars, that are eating M&Ms by the mouthful, what we need to try to do is get them to work some protein in as well, because that will allow some of that sugar to enter the cell. And that way that'll help calm down their cravings. Does that make sense? So if you catch a diabetic eating a handful of M&Ms, try to talk them into a half of a tuna fish sandwich, right? Because we have some carbs and protein or an apple with cheese, some carbs and a protein or peanut butter crackers, some carbs with protein. Make sense? And you can actually help cut down on their cravings if you can get them to, to start to realize, and you'll be helping to get them snacks. So you're in a great position for this, but you'll be helping the cells continue to live and cut down on those overly intense sugar cravings because now the cells aren't dying. Good, makes sense. The worst thing to do to a diabetic patient is belittle them because you think they have no willpower. They're dying. You try dying and see how frantic your body gets, right? This is a real thing. So don't get upset at them. Help them with the actual problem. Good. But if you guys don't want to develop diabetes later in life, you need to start watching your carbs and protein. If you're eating carbs, make sure that you're adding protein in as well. And the ratio really should be two to one. So if you're eating carbs, you need to eat half as much protein as what you're taking in with carbs. So if you go to the hamburger spot down the road and you order a large fry, you probably need to eat at least two hamburger patties, at least, no bun, no condiments, no pickles. I'm just talking about the hamburgers to get in enough protein to offset the carbs you just ate. And depending on the, I'm not talking about the little, I'm talking about the big hamburgers, right? Yeah. But if you're going to have the, the bread and the condiments, now you got to add another one in there to get the ratio right. And it's really hard to eat that much. So naturally you would cut down on your carbs. If you know you got to eat that much protein to be able to justify those carbs, you start to cut down on the carbs. If you can make that switch in your brain, you start focusing on the protein rather than the carb. Carbs taste good, guys. They do. They taste good. That's where all your flavor is. That's where all your flavor is. But if you start to make that association that, oh my gosh, if I want, I can have that many carbs, no problem. No one's not, you know, stopping me. I can have that large fry. But if I eat it, I got to have all of that protein. That's a lot of protein you start to manage your um, balance, your nutrition a little bit better. Yeah, I would do well to practice what I preach. <laughs> Body by carbs, absolutely. All right, so everybody understand this? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the effects of this in the body. So this is a drawing of the arteries in the body. Notice how they're really big here in the middle. 
but off of the middle, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So we need to understand this because as these sugar crystals circulate, 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 they're going to start to coat the inside of the arteries. And these little arteries, these little arteries are gonna get clogged up faster. Where are the little arteries? Hands and feet, and this has to do with gravity because sugar is a crystal, crystal is heavy, gravity on earth is gonna pull heavy down. That means that the lowest part of my upper body are my hands, lowest part of my lower body are my, the diabetics are going to have problems with their hands and their feet. They could also have problems in other small arteries like kidneys, eyes, uh, liver, other organs, but you're gonna see the main effects first in uh, circulation in the hands and the feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they don't have enough, um, they're having to fight the blood flow. Okay, so let's talk about neuropathy because these crystals don't just affect the inside of the arteries, they actually coat the nerves as well. So you can have a patient that has a wound on the bottom of their foot and they may not know it's there because we're hardwired. We're not wireless creatures, we're hardwired. There's an actual physical line that goes from my big toe to my brain. And if that line is corroded with sugar crystals, that signal is not gonna get to my brain. Like my toe knows there's a problem. Hey brain, got a problem. I'm falling off here. But that signal may not make it all the way up here. So my brain may not be aware at all that there's a problem down below. So this is why foot care is so important. Now, unfortunately, a lot of our patients don't know that they're diabetic. We haven't caught it yet. Right? They're diabetic, but we haven't done the testing to know they're diabetic. So we're going to do foot care on everybody looking for problems. So do you guys understand why looking at the foot is the biggest part of foot care? Okay, good. Good. All right, so our um, checkpoints here, we want to support the foot while we move it to and from the basin. We want to soak the foot in water. We're going to wash, rinse, and dry, but we're not going to put lotion between the toes. Remember that uh, pathogens need warm, dark, moist. You guys remember that? Well, between the toes is warm. It's dark. If you put lotion there, it's going to hold in body heat and sweat, which is going to make it moist. And we increase the possibility of developing fungal infections, specifically like athlete's foot. So no lotion between the toes, but we will put lotion everywhere else because feet tend to be a little dry. Um, we're gonna inspect for all, uh, all surfaces for wounds, sores, rashes, or red areas. Don't put the bare feet on the floor. That just kind of makes sense, right? We're gonna have a barrier on the floor while we're doing this. Make sure the foot is always either in the basin or on the barrier or on a towel, no bare feet on the floor. We'll replace the sock at the end of the scale and remove those wrinkles because we know wrinkles contribute to Yep, and we'll apply and secure the shoe over the sock. For me, the hardest part of this skill is getting down on the floor and then getting back up. Okay. I am not as bendy as I used to be. I've got a bad knee and this does not work well for me. But if I had to do it for the test, I would. I'm going to be doing it for taping in a couple of weeks. But for you guys, I'm gonna show you the video. The, I'm going to show you the video because it has really good close-ups. Okay. Remember, you want to support that foot at all times. Do we add soap to the water? Where does the soap go? On the washcloth. Make sure you wring that washcloth out so it's not really drippy wet. Nobody wants to drippy wet anything. Do you have to test the water again? Yes, always. Yep. So when we're doing this, if you look along the side there, skill rules is going to apply. We're going to do our opening. We're gonna use a barrier. This time we'll put it on the floor and we're gonna evaluate for gloves. Now I'm gonna stop there for a second. We talked about this earlier, but just to remind you, when it comes to foot care, the whole reason we're doing this is to look to see if there's a wound. So there's a maybe there. So do we need gloves? 
because there's a maybe, right? So we're gonna use loves. Um, linen rules apply. We don't wanna hold the um, linens against our uniform because our uniform's not clean. Uh, washing rules are gonna apply, all of them. So we're gonna use a paper towel to get the water. We'll check it, they'll check it. No soap in the basin, whatever we wash, we rinse, whatever we rinse, we dry. Warm the lotion up, apply it everywhere but between the toes and then wipe it off again. Okay. Clean the basin the way we clean everything else and then do your closing. Good? Questions? Okay, let's go back here. Hi, Mr. Gunn. My name is Sally. Today, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful. I need to get your clearance. Is that okay? Yes. Let me go close the curtains, wash my hands, and then I'll gather your supplies. Okay. Okay, I'm going to put a barrier, and we'll place this on the floor, right in front of you. And you can place your foot on the barrier. I'm going to get a basin, soap, and lotion. Place that on the barrier. I'm going to get two washcloths and a towel and a set of gloves. I'm going to get some water to wash. Put on 
I'll dry the bottom of your foot. Now I'm going to apply smush. The warm lotion in our hands. Apply lotion to all surfaces except between the toes. So it'll lift your foot. And we'll apply lotion to the bottom as well as the top. And now I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion so that you don't slip. Go ahead and put your foot back on the barrier. And now I can reapply this one. Okay. Don't put your shoe back on. Can you try this one in your filming booth? Okay, Mr. Jones, I need to put all of my supplies in there. I'm going to gather my dirty linen and place it in the dirty linen hamper. I'm going to take the basin to the sink and clean according to the basin cleaning technique. On the way back, I'll collect the soap and the lotion and put the basin back in the drawer. Now I'll collect the barrier and throw it away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is here. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. Can I get you a magazine while you're waiting? No, thank you. I'm going to open my curtains and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps in my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions on that? The skill itself is actually pretty easy. You're just washing the foot. I mean, it's wash, rinse, dry lotion. The skill itself is pretty easy. Um, but remember, the whole reason that you're doing this is to look at the foot. Okay. All right, so let's move on to page 106. So this care plan at the top page 106 tells us the patient has requested a bedpan. So I'm gonna stop there for a second because a question I get asked a lot for this skill and I'm not real sure why people ask it, but the question I get asked a lot for this skill is, well, what if the patient can't use a bedpan? Well, it wouldn't say it on the care plan, right? So if the patient can't use a bedpan, the care plan would have something else there some way of dealing with their toileting needs. Does that make sense? Okay. It says the resident is not wearing undergarments and is able to wipe self, and the resident is able to move as directed. So we've got an able-bodied res resident that doesn't need help getting undressed or wiping themselves. Or we're simply going to put the bedpan there and take it out. I mean, not a really hard skill here. But there's a couple things that we need to know. So first of all, I want to address the fact that it says the resident's not wearing undergarments and can wipe self, because if you look at the bottom of the page, who's gonna be the patient for this? That's you. So for the test, you are gonna remain fully clothed. You're not taking your clothes off. They are going to put a hospital gown over your clothing. The reason this care plan says that you're not wearing undergarments is because they don't want somebody trying to remove your clothing during the test. 
And by having this there, the evaluators can point to it and say the care plan says the patient doesn't need that assistance. It also says the patient's able to wipe themselves. That's because they don't want anybody trying to be in your personal space, right? And the evaluators can point to the care plan and say, the care plan says they can do that themselves. This gives the, because remember the evaluators have to follow the care plan too. So this gives the evaluator something concrete to point to, to keep somebody from doing something during the test that you may not be comfortable with. So this is going to be a simulation skill. You're not really going to pee. Somebody's going to put a bedpan under your bottom and somebody's going to take the bedpan out, but you're not really going to use it. It's a simulation skill. Good? Make sense? All right. So we're going to come back to this in a second, but go to page 76 for me real quick. When you go to work, in any setting, you are going, when you go start your shift, you're going to get report from somebody that's going off shift that dealt with those patients. This process is called report. So if you're coming on at three o'clock and you're going home at three o'clock, you're gonna tell her everything she needs to know about your patients that happened this shift. Now, the type of report you get is gonna vary depending on the setting that you're in. If we're in a hospital, those patients change all the time, not just their condition, but the patients themselves. People come in, they go home. I mean, it's just this constant revolving door of change. So there's not going to be anything written. You're just going to give her all the information verbally. Okay, in room 212, bed A, you've got a 76-year-old female that's recovering from a hip fracture, scheduled to go home tomorrow. She's ambulatory with a walker, um, but she may need some help with ADLs right? So it's all verbal. If you go to work in a long-term care uh, position, like a nursing home, those patients will never change. They're there for years and their condition rarely changes. So it's very stable. So you may end up with a printed report sheet, similar to what you see on the bottom of page 76, where all the, the patient information is there. And now we're just going to go over any changes that occurred like bed 212A fell last night, so they're still on every four hour vitals. So changes would be addressed. Do you guys understand the difference there? Well, as a CNA, there are five specific things you need to know about every single patient. And the first one on the list is toileting because everybody's gotta go usually right at shift change, <laughs> but everybody's got to go. So you need to know right off the bat, how do these people go? Some people will go to the bathroom all by themselves, just like you do. No help necessary. We don't even know about it, right? They just get up and go. Some people will need help to get to the bathroom. That would be bathroom with assist. So if they go all on their own, it would be bathroom ad lib, means the patient takes care of it as needed. If they need help, bathroom with assist. They're gonna hit the call light and ask you to help. If they can't make it to the bathroom, the care plan may say, we use a bedside commode or bedside commode with assist. Now, if none of those work, guys, those are my first four, two, or four top tier options. That's how I want the patient to go, either in the bathroom or if we can't make it to the bathroom, at least we have a bathroom-like experience with a bedside commode, portable toilet. If none of that works, man, I've got a problem because I can't like tell my patients, I'm sorry, you can't go. <laughs> that doesn't work, right? Everybody's got to go somehow. So I got to solve this problem as a nurse. I may look at is the patient continent? I, can they hold it? Can, can they, are they in control? If the answer is no and they're incontinent, we'll just clean them up every two hours around the clock. We're gonna talk about that next week. Nothing really to worry about there. They can't hold it, so there's no going involved. They're gonna go all the time.
But if they can hold it and they can go and they are continent, uh, now I got to do something. So I got to figure out, do they need a catheter? Maybe, possibly, but we only use catheters when we absolutely need a catheter and the urine can't come out in any other way. We don't use catheters for convenience because there's a high rate of infection. So if the patient is continent and doesn't need a catheter, I'm only left with one option and that's the bedpan. Did you notice that was last on the list? Mm -hmm. We don't jump right to bedpan. We have to go through all of that before we get to bedpan. Can they get to the bathroom? Can they get to a bedside commode? Are they continent? Oh crap, bedpan. Way low on the list. Now there's a lot of reasons for that. Number one, bedpans are uncomfortable. Number two, bedpans tend to slosh and spill. Number three, you've been taught from the time you were this tall, don't pee in the bed, don't pee in the bed, don't pee in the bed, and certainly don't poop in the bed. Just because I put a plastic pan under your butt does not mean your brain is going to let you pee in the bed. There's a psychological restriction here. With bedpans, a lot of times it takes two, three, four, five times before the brain will actually let the body go. Very common. Don't get mad at your patient. They've got a good working brain and lessons we learn early in life stick. Okay, good. Makes sense. So bedpan is last on the list. But if we have to use one because our care plan tells us we have to use one, then we have to know how to do it properly. Good. So toileting is always the very first thing we look at when we're looking at report. And then we have to look at eating because everybody's got to eat. So how do they eat? Are they on a special diet? Are they on a fluid restriction? Um, are they in PO, which is nothing by mouth? How do they eat? Then I need to know about the rest of their ADLs, bathing, dressing, grooming, that kind of thing. And then I want to know about mobility. Do they get out of bed? Do they get out of bed on their own? Do they need to be in a chair a certain amount of time? Do they walk with a walker? Are they wheelchair bound? I mean, what is their mobility status? And then there's S for special. Guys, if you use this method, it's called the team's method of reporting. Toileting, eating, ADLs, mobility, and special. This covers absolutely everything you need to know as a CNA. Everything you need to know as a CNA. And it makes report super quick. You can, you can go through and give report on 12, 14, 18 patients in less than 10 minutes. Because if you're going home at three o'clock, you've already worked your eight hours. You want to go home, don't you? Yeah, you don't want to sit here for a half hour. Well, she's asking you all kinds of questions and you're going back to bed A and, you know, because she forgot something. You want to do this very quick and streamlined, concise, but complete. And using the Teams method, make sure you never miss anything. Good. Okay. So toileting, eating, ADLs, mobility, and special. So if you go back to page 106. We know toileting for this patient consists of a bedpan. Now, if you go back a page to page 105, I'm gonna tell you a couple things that are a problem with bedpan. First of all, when you put a bedpan, which you can see at the top of page 105 there, when you put a bedpan underneath a patient, their undercarriage is only about this far from the bottom of the bedpan, flat plastic surface. P comes out under pressure. So you, when you have a liquid under pressure this far from a flat plastic surface, you're gonna get splashback. Their undercarriage is gonna be all kinds of wet or otherwise, not comfortable not comfortable because it's splashback. If there's any other option, we're gonna take it, but if we can't take it, if we have to have a bedpan, our care plan tells us the patient can wipe themselves and most of your patients will try to wipe themselves. 
but there's only this much space to work in, guys. They probably are going to need a little help. Keep that in mind. Okay. They may not be able to get everything as dry as they would like. So make sure that you're helping as needed with that. But there's something you can do to help minimize this splashback problem, but you have to ask the nurse. If we take toilet paper and we make big loops for the toilet paper, five or six big loops for the toilet paper, and then we lay that on the inside of the bed pan before we put it under the patient, it absorbs the urine. No splashback. But if we're measuring the urine, you can't do that. We can't soak it up if we're measuring it. So if your patient is on I's and O's, which is intake and output, we're measuring everything in and everything out. You can't use toilet paper. That's why you have to ask the nurse. There's another problem with bedpans though. Anybody ever sit in a car that had like leather seats or plastic seats with shorts on? What does your skin do? Sticks. Sticks, and that's because skin sticks to plastic surfaces that are heated up. Well, the body is 98 degrees. That's pretty hot. You put a bare butt on a plastic surface, it's going to stick, yeah. So when you try to take that bedpan out from under the patient and it's stuck to their skin, you're gonna have to give it a little bit of force, which could potentially hurt the patient, but it probably will cause whatever's in that bedpan to erupt. Not fun. So again, I've got a trick for you. If you put a little bit of powder on the surface of the bed pan that goes under the butt, that will help slide it in place and slide back out. They won't stick to it, but you have to ask the nurse. Because if the patient has a respiratory condition, we can't use powders. If the patient has a wound, we can't use powders. If the patient has a skin opening, we can't use powder. So the two questions you want to ask your nurse if you're dealing with a patient with a bedpan is, is the patient on eyes and nose or can I use toilet paper in the bedpan? And can I use powder on the surface of the bedpan? If the answer to both of those is yes, do your little happy jig because bedpan just got a whole lot easier. Now, if you look at the bottom of page 105, you'll see a picture of a toilet. If you look at the seat of the toilet, see how the seat is up and it's got that like little opening? Well, right in that opening is something that looks like a little shower head. If you bend that forward, it just pivots forward like this. So it, it's parallel over the toilet bowl. If you bend that thing forward, it'll start spraying into the toilet. It is a bed pan cleaner. That's what it does. And thank God for it, right? We get to clean the bed pan right over the toilet, clean up the contents of the toilet. It's a great system, but we have water under pressure hitting a flat plastic surface. So we will get splash back. And this time we get splash back with a bonus. So you wanna make sure you dress for the job. You wanna cover your clothing with a disposable gown, something we can throw away because you don't want that fecal or urine matter on your uniform when you're gonna go take care of other patients. So you wanna cover your uniform. You also want to cover the holes in your face as well. So a mask with a shield. Guys, a word about masks. Masks do not cut odor. They have no effect on odor at all. So don't wear a mask to try to get away from odors. It's not going to be effective. A better option is to use a little bit of Vicks. You know the stuff mom used to rub, rub on your chest when you were a kid? Just put it just on the inside of your nose. And that does help cut down odor. I can't use that because I have very, very sensitive skin. I put Vicks here and I'm going to look like Rudolph, right? Because of the menthol. So you can get Vaseline. Just get a little small container of Vaseline. Usually like the Dollar Tree places have it. A little small container of Vaseline. Drop a couple drops of whatever your favorite essential oil is. Lemongrass, lavender, eucalypt, whatever your, your oil of choice is, your scent. Mix it up real well and then use that. And it will help cut odors, but masks themselves don't worry. Okay, questions? Privacy is essential for this, guys. Nobody wants to go with an audience. So when you put a patient on a bedpan, you need to leave the area. 
So you're going to wash your hands, go take care of somebody else, make sure the patient has a call light so they can let you know when they're done. But you want to exit the area. If the patient has a roommate and the roommate can go somewhere, this is a great time to take the roommate for a walk. Nobody wants to go with an audience. It's hard to go when you know somebody's three feet away listening to every noise you're making, right? And patients might be a little sensitive to their own odors as well if somebody's right there. So you can have a lot of um, resistance to being able to go. Now, a couple of things you can do to help. Preemptive uh, air freshener is always a good idea, right? So that way we're not masking the odor after, we're preventing it before, yay. Um, but you can also turn the water on in the sink and that helps cut down on sounds. And for patients that have a hard time peeing because they're on, you know, in the bed, it can help with the urinary letdown reflex. So I usually, if I've got a patient on a bedpan, as I leave the room, I'm going to take my gloves off, wash my hands, leave the water running and grab the roommate and take them out for a walk. We'll be back in a few minutes. Gives the patient privacy, the sound of the water helps. So I usually have good results. Good. Problem is for the test, you don't have anywhere else to go. You have no other patients to see. You have no hallway you can walk down. You are stuck with one patient in that room. So for the test, you're simply going to step on the other side of the curtain to give privacy and you're going to wait. You don't have to wash your hands because you're not leaving the area. You're coming right back. Good questions, but don't do that in a clinical setting. Nobody wants to go with an audience. All right, so let me explain to you the biggest part about bedpan and it's not the bedpan. When we are helping a patient with a bedpan, the most important consideration is actually the head of the bed. And let me explain what I mean. So if I've got a patient laying in bed, so this is my patient, this is my bed. My patient has to use a bedpan. I come along, I get a bedpan and I put it under their bottom. What did it do to their bottom? Yeah, raise it up. How many of you ladies can pee uphill? <laughs> And even if you're successful at peeing uphill, that urine's going to run right down your back and into your hair. That's pretty high on my gross meter. So when you put a bedpan under a patient, you need to make sure that they're in a natural elimination position. The head of the bed has to go up. This is the most important step for bedpan. Doesn't have anything to do with bedpan. Has to do with the head of the bed. But now the patient is sitting on that bedpan, pushing it down into the mattress. You can't get it out from under their bottom when they're sitting on it. So we have to put the head of the bed back down to take it out. Head of the bed, most important step. But with all that moving of the head of the bed, whatever's in that bedpan is going to slosh around. So what could we put on the bed that might be, I don't know, waterproof and absorbent? A chucks. So we're gonna put a chucks on the bed underneath the patient, and then we're gonna put the bed pan on top of the chucks. Put the head of the bed up, give them some toilet paper and a call light, tell them to let us know when they're done. We're gonna put the head of the bed back down and take the whole thing out, the chucks and the bed pan together, because you can't carry an open container of urine through a room. I don't know about you, but that's just not a good practice. <laughs> what if you trip? You're gonna go face first into somebody else's stuff. But it's also a privacy issue. Nobody needs to see what's in that bedpan. So we're gonna take the bedpan and chucks out together, wrap the chucks around the bedpan for transport to the bathroom. Good. All right, so we need two sets of gloves for this skill. When I put a chucks underneath the patient, Remember, they don't have undergarments on according to my care plan. So that means that I now have butt juice on those gloves. I'm going to put a bedpan under the patient, but then I have to put the head of the bed up. Do I want to touch that head of the bed controller with butt juice gloves? No. I want to take my butt juice gloves off. 
And then I'm going to put the head of the bed up. At the end of the toileting experience, when they're all done, I'm going to put the head of the bed back down and then put my gloves on to take my new gloves to take the chucks and the bed pan out. Make sense? Okay. Always be on the lookout for butt juice gloves. You don't want those to touch anything else. Okay. You'll never forget that. <laughs> it's for a reason. All right. So everybody good with that? Okay. So this is not a hard skill. We're going to use a privacy blanket. Now you could leave the sheet on. Yes, the patient is covered with a sheet, but remember we got urine under pressure and possible sloshing. And we probably want to make sure the patient has a clean sheet after this is all said and done. So it's best to use a privacy blanket, pull the sheet down underneath, put our gloves on, put the chucks under the patient, bed pan under the patient, gloves off. Head of the bed up, toilet paper call light, and wait. When they're done, which for the test, they're just simulating. So they're going to be done like right now because they don't want to be on that bed pan. We're going to put uh, the head of the bed back down, put our new gloves on, take the bed pan and chucks out, take it to the bathroom. And then we're going to dump our, our pretend pee where? Where does pretend pee go? Toilet, same place regular pee goes. And then we're going to rinse our basin, same way we do everything else. We'll dump the rinse water in the toilet as well and then dry and store. Okay. All right, so let me show you a bedpan real quick. Bedpans are always kept in the bottom drawer. These drawers are designed like a person. Let me show you. So these drawers are designed kind of like a, a human, right? Grooming stuff is at the top. We use grooming stuff here. Bathing stuff is in the middle. We use bathing stuff here. Toileting stuff is in the bottom. We have toileting stuff here. Okay, so grooming, bathing, toileting. So your bedpan is gonna be in the bottom drawer along with your toilet paper. If it looks like a toilet seat, it's where the butt goes. This end goes under the patient. Imagine sitting on that. That's just not gonna be comfortable for anybody. So when you put this under the patient, the widest part of the bedpan goes under the widest part of the patient. Good? Questions? They are making sure you put the bedpan in properly. Now, when you put the head of the bed up, if I put the head of the bed up, the bed is gonna bend where the patient bed. Makes sense, right? The problem is that's right where the bedpan is. We're putting the bedpan where the patient bends. So when we put the head of the bed up, it may shift that bedpan a little bit. You can tell the patient, you can adjust the bedpan as you need to. Okay, good. Questions? During the, during the test, we're just giving them the bedpan. We're not like telling them, here, scoot on it, are we? We are putting a bedpan okay. under a patient. Okay. Real bedpan, real patient, not real people. But yeah, we're, we're going through all the motions. So yeah, you can tell them that we don't want to tell them to scoot on it. We actually are going to have them lift their hips because it tells us that they can move as directed. Okay. So we're going to have them lift their hips and we're going to put the bedpan under them and have them come down awesome. onto the bedpan. But in a clinical setting, if your patient can't lift their hips, most people can. But if your patient can't, then you would roll them on their side, put the bedpan against the bottom and roll them back on top of that bedpan. But when you go to take the bedpan out, you've got to hold that bedpan flat as they roll off of it. If you don't hold that, but you'll only make that mistake once. I guarantee it. <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll learn quick. <laughs> you'll only make that mistake once. All right. So good? Questions on this care plan? No? I'm gonna show you the video for this. I will show you because it has very good close-ups of placing the bedpan um, and removing the bedpan, which is kind of important. And that's not something you'd be able to see from sitting there. Um, this one, 
this particular video takes me a lot of time to tape. I do this one probably about eight times to get all of the views that you see on this video. So that's why I like the video for this one because it shows you things you would not see in class. All right. Remember that all these videos are available for you online. You can watch them at any time to review. Water into the 
we'll set the bed container down to dry. I'll pick it up with a paper towel. I'm going to dry the inside. We'll throw that paper towel away. I'll dry the outside. Throw that paper towel away. And get one for the drawer. Okay, I'm going to place the bed pan in the drawer along with the toilet paper. We'll use the paper towel to close the drawer. Now I can remove my gloves. Thank you. Okay, you can relax your legs if you'd like. And I'm going to pull your sheet up and remove the privacy bag. I want to make sure that we roll the blanket in a ball so that any trailing edges don't consume any other surfaces. There you go. Here's your call light. I'm going to put this in 30 minutes. I'll be right back. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Can I have a piece of that? Your call light is there. Please let me know if there's anything that needs to be here. I'm going to open your curtains and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my chill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my chill is done. Okay, any questions? No questions? All right. Okay, really quickly, I've got five minutes so I can make this happen. So, oh, we talked about that. This is toileting methods. Remember, bedpan is always dead last. All right, so let's go to page 53 in your book. We're actually going to stay right on track. This is amazing. Okay, how do we know what to do with each patient? Care plan. So our care plan on this page tells us to provide the following range of motion to the resident's left shoulder, flexion, extension, and abduction, adduction. Provide three repetitions of each exercise. The resident is not able to help with the exercises. Don't freak out if you don't know the words. It's okay. I'm going to go through it all with you. Okay. Um, but a couple things about this. First, we have to define the difference between passive and active. This tells us passive range of motion in the title. Active is if I tell you what to do, but you do the work. So if I tell you to extend your left arm above your head like you're asking a question, so everybody extend your left arm like you're asking a question, get it nice and straight, don't let that elbow get lazy, all right? Bring it down in front of you, very good. That's active. I told you what to do. I made sure you did it well. That's active. That's not what we're doing here. Our care plan says passive. So passive means I'm going to do the work on the patient. Good? Good? Okay. So if you go back to page 51, everything I'm talking to you about is there. The first thing that we need to understand is what range of motion actually is. I know that in healthcare, we tend to think that everything we do is designed to make the patient better. And that's actually not true here. We have an intent, what's wrong? Oh, there's a bug over there. Oh. Look, please. There we go. It's 
All right, we'll take care of that one. All right, so there's two reasons that exercises are done. Um, and we have to understand which one we're doing. So which one is, is going to be what's expected of us. In order to do exercises to regain function or make something better, there, we have a whole department for that. Anybody know what that department is? Physical therapy, they do exercises to make patients better. Physical therapists have to have a doctorate degree. That's 10 to 12 years of education. How long are we here? Four weeks. Four weeks, that can't be us. That's not us. 10 to 12 years to learn how to do exercises to make something better. That's not us. As CNAs, we do exercises to retain current function to keep the patient from going backwards. So we are not the no pain, no gain gang. That's not us, right? We're not doing things to induce pain in hopes of building muscle or um, improving coordination. It's not us. We're only gonna do what the patient can do, but we're going to help them do it when they can't do it themselves. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me give you a, a really quick story to explain why this would be important. Let's talk about Frank. Frank lives across the street, not in the assisted living. He actually lives in a house in the neighborhood. There's like, I don't know, a couple thousand houses across the street in that um, neighborhood. And they drive golf carts all over. They bridge club. They play tennis. They do all kinds of stuff. And Frank is a widower. His wife passed away a couple of years ago. And um, he plays tennis with his brother, Ralph, every Tuesday, and they're highly competitive. And on this particular Tuesday, Frank went to hit a volley back to Ralph, and he really wailed on that ball because he wanted to win. And when he did, he felt something in his right arm give way. He dropped the racket, and off to the ER they go. ER doc says, good news, bad news. The bad news is you tore your rotator cuff on your right side, and you're probably right-handed. Frank said, yeah, I'm right-handed. He says, that's bad news. But the good news is the surgeon has an opening tomorrow and can get you fixed right up. He says, sign me up. I can't go home like this. So he has surgery. Two days later, the discharge planner comes in and says, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. I need that bed for other sick people. You got to go somewhere. If you go home, you're going to need somebody to help you. You're going to need somebody to help with bathing, dressing, grooming, making your meals cutting your meat, opening your milk, that kind of thing. And you're going to need physical therapy and you can't drive right now. So you need somebody to take you back and forth. Do you have anyone at home? He says, no, my wife passed away. My brother still works. I'm alone. She says, what about a rehab? They have physical therapy right there. Can get you fixed up good as noon, six weeks. And they got pretty girls to do all the rest. He says, sign me up. So here he is in our facility. And on day one, I go in and I do my head to toe assessment. And I'm looking for real problems and potential problems. And I ask you to help him with bathing, dressing, and grooming. I ask you to help open his meat or cut his meat and open his milk, right? Um, and I ask you to help get him back and forth to physical therapy twice a day so they can work on that right arm. Well, at the end of six weeks, how much is that left arm done if you've been helping him with bathing, dressing, and grooming, and you've been cutting his meat and opening his milk? What's going to happen to an arm that isn't moving a whole lot over six weeks? We're going to lose muscle mass. It's called atrophy. It's going to become weaker, and the shoulder itself can lose mobility, and it's called a frozen shoulder. So at the end of six weeks, congratulations, we fixed his right, but oops, we broke his left. We didn't help. The patient's going home in the same condition he came in in, just reversed. So let's go back to the first day when I go in and I do my head to toe assessment and I'm looking for real problems and, and I know this is a potential problem. So I ask you to help him with bathing, dressing, and grooming. You're going to help cut his meat, open his milk. You're going to help get him physical therapy and you are going to do range of motion exercises on the left shoulder twice a shift. And that keeps that left arm moving the way it moves now. So at the end of six weeks, when he goes home, he's going home with two good shoulders. It's not one we broke. Does that make sense? So that's why we do range of motion. 
Now there's three different exercises that we can do as CNAs. And if you go to page 52, they're right there in the middle of the first column. Flexion extension is up down. That's what you just did. I told you to extend your arm above your head. You knew what that was, but I actually gave you a practical example. I said, extend your arm above your head like you're asking a question. Every one of you knew what that looked like and could perform that activity. I'm gonna do the same thing with the patient. If I'm moving their body, they have a right to know how I'm moving that body. So I'm gonna tell them, I'm going to raise your arm above your head like you're asking a question. Flexion extension is up, down. Abduction, abduction is a side to side movement. When you abduct a child, don't do that, but if you abducted a child, you would take it away from its family. When you abduct an extremity, you would take it away from its family. So this would look like a snow angel. This is a different motion than this. Flexion extension is up down in front of us. And I told you when you brought your arm down to do it in front of you. Abduction, ad adduction is a side to side on the side of you. It works different muscle groups. Rotation is around. Now, rotation of the shoulder, our care plan doesn't tell us to do it. But rotation of a ball joint, like a shoulder or a hip, is not done in a pitch or wind up. This is not a rotation motion. A rotation motion, if you put one of your arms out to the side, palm up, and then roll that arm all the way over so your palm up backwards. Feel what that does inside your shoulder. That is a rotation motion. Okay, good. So how do we know which of these three motions to do on this patient? How do we know which body part we should be exercising? How do we know what, uh, how many repetitions to do? So you're telling me all I have to do is read and follow directions for the test? So I just got a comment on YouTube yesterday, somebody that was uh, remarking on one of the range of motion videos and said, this isn't range of motion because you did not do um, abduction, adduction of the hip. Well, the care plan did not tell us to do abduction, adduction of the hip. So what do you think is going to happen to this person when they go test and they do exercises that aren't indicated on the care plan? And they're not going to know why. Are you guys starting to see why I teach you the way I teach you from the very beginning of day one? I am test proofing you. There is no way that you will be able to fail the test. It wouldn't even dawn on you to do an exercise that's not in the care plan. Good? Makes sense? More importantly, you won't end up injuring patients out there because you think you know what should be done on those patients. And when I'm the body in the bed, that might be important to me. Good? Questions? Range of motion shoulder? Good. All right. So I need a body in that bed, please. <laughs> Give me a body in that bed. Yeah, I know. Sorry. <laughs> this room needs to be like maybe four feet wider. All right, for the sake of time, I am going to, go ahead. I'm going to simulate hand washing for the sake of time, okay? Oops, yeah, hold on. I forgot to hit a button, hold on. There we go. So this is a top-down view. You guys are all seeing it from this angle as well. Here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today, how are you? Fantastic. I need to do some exercises on your left shoulder. Is that okay? I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands and I'll be right back. I've washed my hands for the test. All right, Ms. Jones, I'm going to lift your arm above your head and back down to the bed like you're asking a question. 
I'm going to do all the work. All you have to do is let me know if there's any pain or discomfort as we do this. Now, with every skill, I'm going to evaluate whether I need gloves. This patient fully dressed. I'm not touching any of her private areas. She is holding on to all of her own body fluids like a champ. And there's no open skin that I'm going to come into contact with. So for this patient right here, right now, do I need gloves? If any of those changed on a patient that you took care of out there, you may need gloves. We evaluate for every single time. All right. So when I lift, I don't want to lift from above like the claw machine at Walmart, right? If I lift like this, my fingertips are going to dig into her and I could drop her extremity. So I always lift from below with a flat palm. So I'm going to put one hand under her elbow and one under the wrist, and we're going to go up. On the way down, I'll switch and come back down. Feel okay? Any pain? Okay, we're going to go up again. And all the way back down. And one more. Up again. And all the way back down. Feel okay? Okay, I'm going to bring your arm out to the side and back in like you're making a snow angel. I'll do the work. Just let me know if there's any pain. So again, I want to support those two joints. I'm going to go up and back to start. Always return back to start. This is number two, up, all the way back to start. One more, up, all the way back to start. Feel okay? Is there any pain or discomfort? Are you comfortable? Would you like a magazine before I go? Okay, let me go see what I can find for you. Here's your call light. If you need anything at all, please feel free to hit that red button and let me know. Your environment is clean. I'm gonna go ahead and open the curtain, wash my hands, think about my skill and make any corrections. I might read that care plan one more time just to make sure I got everything right before I ended my skill. And then I would tell the evaluator my skill is done and go find you a magazine. Okay. Hmm? You're welcome. You are free to go. You can put it anywhere you want to put it. So, you know, it's, it's accessible to you. So our um, important points here, our important points is that we want to lift from below, always return to, support, to start. We're going to support at two joints and monitor for pain. And you saw me do that for both of those exercises. Good. Questions? No questions? All right, so important. We're gonna move on to test registration. I've only got 15 minutes left, so we're gonna get through this very quickly. On my website, foryourcna.com, you actually see it on the very front of your book, this little computer guy, foryourcna.com. This is this site. Now we are working on the site. It may look slightly different from this at some point in the future when I get it done. Um, but right now, if you go under the testing menu, if you hover over that, another menu will pop up. Test registration instructions. You wanna bookmark this page because everything I'm about to tell you, I'm gonna go through very quickly. You're gonna to wanna to go to this page. On this page, I have two presentations. One of them is a movie where I actually do a registration on the screen with you. You see what I put in each box and I tell you why I put that thing in the box. I walk you through the whole thing. I mean, the whole thing from going from a search engine to getting to the site to print, I mean, everything is covered going to your email, confirming your account, it's all covered in that video. Below that is a step-by-step slide-based uh, presentation, same thing, but this time you control the speed. So watch the video so you can kind of follow along and see what's happening, and then go to the slide-based presentation and follow each step as I do it. If you do that, you can't mess this up, okay? But I even, even did some things to help prevent you from messing this up. So these are the test registration packets. 
this whole thing is a packet. So pass that whole thing down. Those of you joining us from YouTube world, if you're a current student, I'll give you your packet when you come back to class. If you're uh, joining us remotely, you can print this off on, um, the links are on foryourcna.com. But you'll be going to Prometrics website. Okay, so the first thing that you see, this page right here, this, which you can see right here, the first thing that you see um, is our timeline. So you can see that there's four steps to this process. The first step is to get your background check. If you do not have a level two background check with photo within the last five years for health care, you got to go get one. So if you have a concealed weapons and you did a background check, that doesn't count. That's before health care. If you have a, if you worked in the nutrition department of a nursing home and you got a background check, but it didn't have a photo, it doesn't count. It has to be a level two with photo for healthcare in the last five years. If you're not sure, go get one. Because if you don't have a background check on file, um, everything kind of stops. So. This tells you where to go. This uh, deontis.com slash Florida is who I recommend it. They use the UPS store on Barclay. They're really quick. You can get same day or next day appointments. Um, and the registration process is pretty easy. There are other places that you can go. Sheriff's Department usually does not qualify. So you have to, to be really careful. I, somebody did go to the Sheriff's Department recently and they said that it, it did work. So that may have changed. But remember, it has to be a live scan level two with photo. And there's a code that you're going to need. You see uh, right here, let me go back here. See right here where it's all shaded? See that code? E, uh, the ORI number, EDOH 0380Z. You need this code that routes this background check to the right place so they're able to find it. Okay, good. Please don't call me at 2 a.m. asking what the code is. I'm guessing that happened to you, huh? Yes, it did. All right, so you're going to get your background check done. After you do your background check, and when you go get the background check, they don't give you anything. Like they're not gonna give you your fingerprints to mail somewhere. There's a whole chain of custody here because everybody has access to Photoshop and I can take a bad background and make it a good one with enough money, <laughs> right? I'm kidding. <laughs> but because people have access to uh, programs that can uh, you know, falsify documents, they're not gonna give you the documents. So this gets transmitted electronically, you don't get it. You just go to the appointment, they take a picture, you sign a form, they take your fingerprints, and that's it. You go home. Everything gets transmitted electronically so that nobody can do anything to alter your background. 24 hours later, you're going to submit your application, which we're going to go over together in just a minute. One to three days after you submit your application, you're going to get an email from Prometric. If there's an attachment, open the attachment. But that email from Prometric is going to... Come back here. Look like this. This is what the email from Prometric looks like. You want to make sure that it says application status complete. Complete means they were able to find your background check and your payment went through. If either one of those doesn't work, this whole process stops. So you want to look to see, does it say background, uh, background status or um, application status complete? Down here where it says FBI background status, it may say record found. It may say record or it may be blank. But if it says in there record not found, it means that there's something wrong with your background check. Either you don't have one, they couldn't find it, or there was something wrong with a discrepancy between the information you submitted and the background check. 
So pay attention to those two sections. But hopefully everything will go right. It'll say complete and that box will be blank, ideally. When that happens, that just kind of lets you know that they are sending your application and your background to the Florida Board of Nursing for approval. So you're just gonna hang tight and wait. Takes about seven to 10 days. This is an eyes on event. It's not automated. So they send everything to the Board of Nursing. Board of Nursing has a person that looks at your application and your background check and makes sure that you aren't gonna kill grandma. That's what they're looking for. If they have questions, if there's something on your background that they want more information about, they're gonna contact you and say, hey, I would like more information. You need, if you have a criminal background, you need to type up a letter giving your side of the story. That way, if they request it, it's ready to go. You don't send it with your application. If they want more information, they'll contact you and then you would send it. You probably also need your court records as well. So you might wanna get them together and have them available. Good, make sense? Everybody okay? Seven to 10 day days after you get this email, you're gonna get another email with your test date. And that is gonna look like this. It's gonna tell you your testing location. It's gonna show that you're scheduled for both parts, the written and the skill. And it'll have like nine and 905. That doesn't mean you only have five minutes. It just means you're scheduled for both sections. Date, you do not pick they assign you a date but if you get this email and you open it up and it says july 21st and you've got something going on july 21st you absolutely positively cannot make that date you pick up the phone and you call prometric and say hey that date does not work for me and while they're on the phone with you they will uh, come up with a, a date that's mutually agreeable but the first one they assign now if your date is July 21st and you wait until July 19th to call them up and say, hey, that date doesn't work for, you, for me, they're going to go, yeah, that's tough, <laughs> but we're not refunding. We don't refund. This is your responsibility. So you need to let them know it is, as soon as you know there's a problem, you need to let them know. Because if you let them know early enough and they take you out of that spot, they can put somebody else in it. And now they're not only testing seven when there's room for eight. Does that make sense? They actually used to do appointments years ago. Do you know how many people don't show up for appointments? A lot. So they, they took this out of your hands completely. They don't do appointments now. They assign a date and they figure if it's important enough to you, you'll make it happen. It's not a risk that they're going to take. Yes, you do. So at the bottom of this page, see down here at the bottom, these are test site location codes. So our closest one is in Tampa by the airport, it's, you know, take the parkway down, it's by the airport. There's another one in Tampa on the other side of Tampa, like past Bush, Bush Gardens. So Tampa by the airport is closest. The other Tampa, if you wanna to go to Bush Gardens after, that's fine. Um, but there's uh, test locations all over the state. Those of you in Citrus County, Ocala may be closer to you. There is one in Ocala. Actually, there's two in Ocala now, um, What? but, the second up is way up past Silver Spring Shores, like Bellevue area. So um, you kind of have to figure out where it's gonna work for you as far as a testing location. But yes, you get to pick your testing location. Those of you who like to cruise, you might wanna test in Miami and jump on a cruise ship afterwards to celebrate, I don't know. <laughs> but there are testing locations in major cities all across Florida. We used to have a testing location in Pasco County, but there wasn't enough demand for it, so it closed. So our closest now is in Tampa. Okay. What's the exact address and stuff? What does it So right here, this, these are all the testing locations in Florida with their addresses. 
So you can take a look and see which one will work best for you. I'm gonna tell you that the one in Tampa is closest. So when you get that email from Prometric, it's gonna have the name of the testing center and the address. So you're gonna know that two to three weeks in advance of your testing. So now that you've got the actual address, you can map quest it or look it up on Google Maps or whatever it is you're gonna do. Take a dry run, you know, travel there, whatever you want to do to prepare. But you'll have that information when you get your test admission letter with your date. Okay. You're welcome. Good. Questions? All right. So to recap, we're going to make sure we have a background check. We're going to apply for the test. If you need a background check, use that code. Don't call me. Um, apply for the test. One to three days later, you're going to get an email. Open the attachment. Make sure it says complete. Seven to 10 days later, you're going to get your test date in the mail. Generally speaking, they give you about a week or so notice between, okay, you're clear to test. You know, here's your test date and then the test date. You know, it, it's usually about a week to 10 days. They don't give you a lot of notice. It's not a month in the future. It's pretty quick. Okay, good. So keep your schedule kind of fluid for the next couple of days. If you submit this, if you do this process today, you know, cause I'm giving you all this stuff, you should be testing about a week or two after graduation. Perfect timing. If you wait, it just pushes that test date back even further. Do not wait six months and then register for the test. You'll forget everything I said. The test is 155. So let's go through this real quick. I know that time is up, but let me real quick. First page, demographics. Please make sure your name is the na your name and you have two forms of ID to prove it. That's that stop sign. Second page, demographics and criminal history. Guys, if you have no criminal history, the answers are gonna be no. Um, third page, disciplinary history and other criminal history. Again, read and answer. And all of this is in that video. Okay, all of it's in the video. Health history, which is on page four, I can't help you with. There are specific mental health questions. Healthcare is stressful, people. If you have no stress coping mechanisms, it may not be the place for you. Um, the fifth page, I actually filled out for you. Page five, you are all going to register as E3 challengers. I X'd out training information because it only applies if you checked E1 or E2, we checked E3. And we have regional test site at the bottom. This code area is what you would need this for. So you would figure out where you want to test and put that code in here if you're going to mail in the paper application. If you're going to do this online, which is what those instructions are all about, if you're going to do this, same application both places, but if you're going to register online, it's a drop down menu that actually lists all of the testing locations. You would just pick the one you want. Okay, and then down here at the bottom is your testing fees. You guys are gonna take the first option, clinical and written in English. If you want the written in Spanish, there's an option for that. If you want the written to be read to you by computer, there's an option for that. But most of you should check the first one for 155. The next page, I've already checked off that you've read and received these papers right here. It's always up here. You can read this on your own. This is their privacy policy, tells you how they're going to use your information. There's also a link to it on their website. And then you're going to read the affidavit, sign and date. If you're mailing in this paper application, this is your payment page. Fill out your payment page. If you're doing this online, you'll just input your payment information online. Good. The application is the same. Online registration adds a level of complexity because you have to register for an account, confirm the account, and then know where to go to get to the application. That's, I've got all of that in the video. So this paper application you can fill out and mail in, might be the easiest way, but it takes longer. Online application, a little bit harder, but my video goes through it in detail. 
I will be happy to help you more on Monday. Um, but it is the weekend. I want you guys to go have some fun. Somebody's going to Disney. Congratulations. Here's your review sheet. Here we go. Review sheet. Can you pass that one down, please? Thank you. All right. Have a fantastic day, and I will see you next Monday. Have a good weekend, guys. Yes, have fun. Bye bye. Okay. All right, YouTube world. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and sign off. So remember, I have my live tomorrow at 3 p.m. Feel free to join me for my live at 3 question and answer session. And we'll see you on Monday for class. Till next time, happy caregiving. Bye.